Uh, hello, my name is Matthew Sands. I, I represent a project called The Nations of Sanity, um, and I'm here speaking with Urza from. Um, sorry, what's your channel called? Uh, my co my channel is called Swobodny Přístav, which means free haven in English. Free haven. So, uh, hello everybody who is listening to this. Uh, nice to nice to be here. Nice to meet the Nations of Sanity project. Uh, as I said, I am from Svobodný přístav, which means in Czech language, uh, free haven. And uh, before we start, I just want to say that I am stepping a bit out of my comfort zone because I am not used to talk in English. So I'm sorry for my accent and if I will be missing some words, uh, I hope you will be forgiving. Yeah, yeah, we you're speaking perfectly fine to me. So. Um... Okay, I'll put a link to your channel so anyone who wants to obviously check it out um, can obviously just click on the link and find it. Um, and yeah, and basically, we, I was recommended somebody commented on a video on one of my videos um, suggesting that I get in contact with you. Um, I think it was a video I done where I was having a debate with David Friedman about um, anarcho-capitalism and how it's defined. Um, and essentially. Um, to sort of sum up the debate was because um, he has a conceptualization of anarcho-capitalism that would allow for things like drug laws um, and I was kind of saying well that seems to contradict the definition of what anarcho-capitalism capitalism would be at least according to my own definition of it um, so we kind of went through what what is anarchism and what is capitalism and why we why I think something like drug laws doesn't fit into the definition and why he thinks something like does so, um, something like drug laws does fit into the definition um, from my point of view um, anarcho-capitalism you've obviously got the anarchism side of it which means no rulers and and capitalism which is really just a kind of concept of property rights um, so for me something like drug laws should be a non-starter because the non-aggression principle which drug laws clearly violate is so heavily implied under both the definition of anarchism and the definition of capitalism. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, I think that uh, it very much depends what do you mean by drug lord. If you by drug lord mean a person who is uh, creating drugs, uh, manufacturing them and selling them, then I think this is perfectly fine with this principle of non-aggression non -aggression principle and it's perfectly fine with anarcho-capitalism. But here, in this world where the states are, they are putting this uh, out of the laws. So <clears throat> to be drug lord doesn't mean just to be oh, somebody. Sorry, who... sorry to interrupt. I said drug laws, as in like laws against laws, drugs. I'm sorry. I, I, I understood lords. Uh, I, I'm <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. This is the, the problem with my English. <laughs> yeah, okay. I think that the uh, drug laws are absolutely against uh, non aggression principle and they are against uh, anarcho capitalism because. Uh, this is just some states are telling the people what, what drugs uh, should they use or shouldn't. And I think this is absolutely uh, personal freedom of everybody to choose what <coughs> what drugs he want to use. Yeah, I mean, that is basically my position as well. I mean, I, to, to defend that, you know, David's position, he wasn't saying that he thought it was likely, but just that the definition was allowed and it's something that could happen within a, an arco capitalist society. And he was sort of describing like private security forces and what have you enforcing drug laws within a certain area. Now, I still think that goes against the narco capitalism, um, but I just wanted to clarify that, you know, he wasn't advocating for drug laws or saying that they're a good thing, but he does think that an anarcho-capitalism would allow for them and, and I don't think that it would because as you say it violates property rights, self-ownership. I think there is a difference between non-aggression okay. principle and property rights and between real anarcho-capitalist uh, anarcho -capitalist society. Uh, we should differ these two things. Uh, Non-aggression principle which is equal to property rights, uh, this is something which is absolutely implying anarcho-capitalism but Anarcho a real anarcho-capitalist society does not necessarily imply that uh, everybody will follow a non aggression principle and that uh, no uh, property rights will be violated. So even in anarcho-capitalist society, the laws which will be enforced by uh, free marketers, uh, by free market, uh, I don't know, courts or arbiters and so on, I think uh, that these laws 
will be convergating to the non-aggressional principle, like they will be very close to it, but they don't need to be necessarily the same as a non-aggressional principle. There can be some uh, some exceptions. So uh, the the companies which will in enforce the law will be probably following negative rights, which are property rights, because this is what making them not being in conflict. Uh, but if the society would very strongly, uh, very strongly ask for something which is against property rights, then I can imagine that even the uh, free market uh, enforcers of the law would break the property rights for this. But I think that there is very big difference between democratic society and anarcho-capitalist society. In democratic society, there can be just 51% of politicians, which is not even 50% of voters. So even 30 or 25% of voters can effectively uh, put on whole society some ban of drugs, for example. But in anarcho-capitalist society, it's possible that there would be drug ban and drug laws and so on. But I think it's very, very unlikely because, for example, 90% of, of people would need to ask for this. And I can't imagine that 90% of people would really ask for drug laws. OK, oh, well, then it sounds like you're actually more agreeing with David Friedman then, because that's essentially his sort of argument that, you know, you could potentially have, you know, uh, market forces, as, as you put it, um, sort of asking for it rather than like a democratic vote in a status system. I mean, my problem with that and my side of the sort of argument against that is like when you talk about, oh, well, this could happen in a free market. Or, or, for example, private security or police forces could enforce laws that step outside the non-aggression principle. From my point of view and from my definition of anarcho-capitalism, it seems that once that happens, because obviously there's no magic guarantee any system you have is going to stay as it is. But my assertion is that once that happens, once you have drug laws, it's no longer a free market. Once you have coercion or any kind of violation of the non-aggression principle, being practiced legitimately or you know at least with the um you know sense of being legitimate then in my mind and my definition of anarcho-capitalism which i'd like to explore more with you um it, it seems to then it, it like the argument i put to david friedman is um you know like for example if an if we had an anarcho-capitalist society and just you know, through people's will and deciding they all started becoming communists, we wouldn't call it an anarcho capitalist society anymore if it, if it became a communist society. And I kind of make the same point, obviously, to a less obvious degree. But if we started violating property rights, which any law that's outside of the non aggression principle surely would do, then it does don't we violate the very free market that defines anarcho capitalism? I see it quite opposite with the communism, for example, when in anarcho-capitalist society, they will be creating uh, communes, some uh, communities of communists. It's still anarcho-capitalism as long as they are doing it voluntarily. So if you have communists in anarcho-capitalism and they will create their, I don't know, city or their something which is on their property, uh, it's anarcho-capitalism even if they are having internal communism there, as long as they all agreed when they were put into it. Uh, as long as they are not, uh, as they are, as as long as they are not violating property of anybody else, it's still anarcho-capitalism for me. However, uh, the the drug laws and the violating of non-aggression principle, I think you have a scale. It's not like one or zero. It's not bin binary. It's not like either it's 100% uh, non-aggression principle or it's not at all. I think it's a scale, and I don't think we can say that as long as there will be even one violation of non-aggression principle, it's not anarcho-capitalist society because it doesn't matter if the if the violation is done by some personal or by company which is enforcing law or by company which is, I don't know, selling shoes. Uh, these companies in anarcho-capitalism has the same uh, the same law statement the uh, the law enforcers are nothing uh, nothing more in the society than any other company so you can say as long as there is a shoe producer who is 
who is breaking no aggression principle because he's, for example, stealing on his customers. It's not anarcho capitalism anymore. And I think this is not true. I think that uh, I think that you, you have some scale. And for example, and this is, of course, uh, somehow subjective. You can't objectively say when on the scale it starts anarcho capitalism and when, when there is not anarcho capitalism anymore. This will be subjective point of view. But I believe that you can't have society where the non aggression principle will be followed for 100% all the time by any company. And I don't think there is no not a difference if the non aggression principle is violated by law enforcers or if the non aggression principle is violated by any other individual in that society. OK, yeah, I mean, I, I, I kind of agree with that because um, I do agree that just because the non-aggression principle is being violated to some degree doesn't necessarily disqualify the whole society mm -hmm. as calling itself a narco-capitalist. But if that aggression is seen as legitimate on a societal level, you know, it's like, you know, because it's like, I mean, for example, the voluntarist society that I advocate, and I, I identify more voluntarist than I do, and I don't really identify as an anarcho-capitalist. I, I, I consider like, myself as both. Yeah, I mean, I, I, well, my... I mean, my conceptualization again of anarcho capitalism is that anarcho capitalism is voluntarism, but voluntarism isn't necessarily anarcho capitalism. Like, you could be a voluntarist, but not necessarily be a, an anarcho capitalist, which is how I kind of feel about my own position. Um, but you, if you're an anarcho capitalist, you should be a voluntarist because it's kind of like a branch off of that in my mind. But again, this may be a flaw in my own definition of of what anarcho capitalism is but my point is it's not about whether the non-aggression principle is never violated it's about whether it's deemed legitimate within the definition of the society so for example like if you said oh like if there's a company that's stealing from its customers or or stealing anything or whatever the, the point is is we recognize that they're stealing it we don't think that they've acquired legitimate ownership because of that and if someone had their security forces and they were going around committing acts of violence against drug users because in their mind they're enforcing drug laws that they've you know uh, they feel that they have the right to enforce in a, it fr from a, from a a narco capitalist point of view they're just committing crimes they're just assaulting people they're just committing acts of aggression so this is why but so when i say that i don't i don't say that like you know people can't commit crimes or people can't violate the non-aggression principle in a narco capitalist society i'm just saying that in a narco capitalist society any violation of the non-aggression principle would be seen as a crime um because the whole the the free market the entire free market that anarcho capitalism is essentially kind of you know the idea the property rights that it's built on is tied to the non-aggression principle so it seems like you know like for example if i steal your car i might be in possession of it but a narco capitalist society would say it's still your car and i stole it if i start enforcing drug laws against people and an anarcho capitalist society shouldn't be saying that i'm enforcing any laws they should be saying i'm committing crimes myself you know well, uh, the drug laws are quite extreme example because it's very big uh, limitation of uh, freedom and property rights to all the society. But if you look to some uh, to some other example, which is much lighter, much uh, less, um, much less significant, for example, uh, somebody would be torturing his dog and his neighbor will come and take the dog away from his owner because uh, he doesn't want the owner to torture the dog. The society, which would be quite perfectly uh, compatible with the non-aggression principle, and in such society, if there would be public case, like somebody somebody was owner of the dog, he was, he was torturing the dog, the neighbor came and take the dog away to make him safe. Uh, I can imagine that such society would be standing on the side of the neighbor who stole, who stole the dog and clearly uh, violated the property rights. I would have problem in myself to say, no, this is not anarcho-capitalist society just because uh, the society legitimized the dog, dog stealing. And I can see there many other many other uh, things like that when i don't know you have you you can you can break the non aggression principle by many little ways in in little cases 
And if there will be a society which would be following the non-aggression principle, but in some exceptions, the people would feel as legitimate to violate it, I would still call it anarcho-capitalism, anarcho-capitalist society, because these violations and deviations are still too little to me. Uh, and m- moreover, I think that even anarcho-capitalists are not perfectly, are not always perfectly uh, agreeing with themselves, which is non, non-aggression principle. So, for example, Rothbard said that the kids are property of the of their parents. But, for example, I don't think this. I think that uh, everybody is his owner since he's born, since he's uh, since he's created. And, for example, Rothbard uh, was also for the intellectual property. And uh, many others after him are not, and they are saying that, that, that uh, the intellectual property is not a property and the, the property rights are not applied to the intellectual property. So, even if we look at this, we see that uh, there is a lot of anarcho capitalism with Anarcho-capitalists are very consistent, even together. Like, uh, if you talk to anarcho-communists, they are much more different from each other than anarcho-capitalists. Uh, but even anarcho-capitalists has there some uh, some not, not clear things. So I think I, I would I would still accept as anarcho-capitalist society something which is basically somehow following non-aggression principle mostly. It's, I know it's subjective, I can't have some objective matter, but I don't believe that there can be a society which would be in long term for 100% considered as leg- legitimate only the non-aggression principle and will never uh, do some, some, some exception of it. So I, I believe that Anarcho-capitalist society can have some uh, some variations from the non-aggression non-aggression principle. Yeah, I understand the point you're making. I think it veers a little bit away from my point because, I mean, the reason why I use drug laws, I intentionally use something that was clearly a violation of the non-aggression principle, like intentionally for that reason. Because I think the issue of grey areas is. Uh, obviously important as well and it's a you know a reality that we have to face but it's slightly different like my point is is an anarcho-capitalist society can't have clear violations of the non-aggression principle you know there's still the issue of like because because the thing is is when you're giving examples of gray areas where people were debating whether or not it is a violation of the non-aggression principle and saying, well, we could have an anarcho-capitalist society where people were debating because it's in that fuzzy edge and gray area or whatever. Um, whereas the not, whereas like um, if it's like something like drug laws, then that's a clear violation of the non-aggression principle. So for me, that's where it kind of clearly disqualifies itself. But the dog is also clear, uh, clear. I don't think it is, actually. I mean, I, 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 I don't think it is because I... I mean, we, we we could end up we could go into a detour on the conversation about animal rights um, and whether the non-aggression principle extends to animals in any way. Um, but it's like before we do, if we if you want to go down that road. Um, but before we do, just to address like some of the points that Rothbard made, because the thing is, is there there is the issue of grey areas. There is the issue of where there's real kind of like ambiguity. Is this a violation? Is it not? You know, there are fuzzy edges. You know, and even when we have clear. Um, things we have things like you know like age of consent you know like even if we accept there's a different standard of rules for a child than there is for an adult there's still a fuzzy edge between when one becomes the other and stuff like that um but my point is and i have an approach with the nation's sanity project for dealing with gray areas where we kind of try to draw a line in the sand where we say okay well this is kind of reasonably certain at this point and the gray area side of it okay that's ambiguous we couldn't enforce that as like a universal a universal law um but there are some things there are some claims there are some areas where anarcho-capitalists disagree where i actually think we can say that they are objectively wrong it's not a gray area and one of the examples i would give of that well actually i'll give two examples is is where rothbard is um objectively wrong in my opinion which i suppose is subjective but i think i can make an objective case for rothbard being wrong if he's saying that intellectual property rights is you know 
uh, a legitimate thing, you know, like in, enforcing IP laws is legitimate. I, I would say that he is wrong as a matter of black and white. It's not a grey area. He is, you know, objectively wrong. And he's also objectively wrong to say that children are property of their parents. Like I say parents are guardians of their children and the control that we have over our children that he seems to be mistaking for some kind of ownership over property. I would say actually, no, that control that we have over our children as their guardians is actually the result of our self ownership over ourselves and the fact that we owe a duty of care to our children because we brought them in the world. And the example I always use is I say like, you know, you don't, the non-aggression principle doesn't say that you have to risk your life to jump in the water to save a drowning person. You're not responsible for them drowning unless you push them in the water. If you push them in the water, then you are responsible for them drowning because you caused that. And I use a similar ethos to say, okay, well, when you bring a child into this world, it's similar to a person who can't swim being pushed into the water. They can't fend for themselves. So you put them in peril and that makes you responsible for them until they are out of that peril. And in the case of a child, that's when they are old enough to take responsibility for themselves. So, so I think a proper um, conceptualization of the parent-child relationship is not owner and property because people aren't property. It's guardianship over who you have that who you owe that duty of care to. I basically agree with you. I wouldn't say that Rosebud was objectively wrong. I think he has just different opinion than us, and uh, I also don't agree with Rosebud on uh, that kids are the property of parents. I don't think that they are. And I also don't believe in intellectual property. So, but but I wouldn't say that he is objectively wrong because what's objective wrong? Well, I have to just say he, he he sees the he sees the thing different than than, than we do, and uh, yes, he just has a different opinion. Uh, by the way, in the in the case of uh, in the case of intellectual property, I would even say that. Um, he didn't think about it so much because the the main discussion were developed uh, even after I mean between libertarians uh, after he was very old or even after his death. So I would say that uh, the, the the thing with intellectual property, if Rosebart would be still alive, I can't imagine I can imagine that he would in the end agree with the with the opponent of opponents of intellectual property. I, I can't imagine this. The same as I can imagine that if Mises would be uh, living longer, he would maybe become an anarchist uh, instead of my anarchist. I don't know that, but I can I can imagine. But um, okay, if, if you if, if the example with the dog and we can argue of the of the animal rights is not is not uh, ideal for you. I can I can say another one which would be like perfect violation of uh, of non-aggression principle. For example, you are going with your wife somewhere, and some men come, and he would uh, he would verbally insult her very hardly. You would lose your mind, and you would hit him. This is absolute uh, violation of non-aggression principle. And uh, but I believe that even in some anarcho-capitalist society, even if all anarchists would agree that this hit would be against non-aggression principle, I can imagine that in some anarcho-capitalist society, the judge would say this was okay uh, because he didn't want to piss off his uh, customers. And uh, for example, I don't think that it would be always like this, but I, I can imagine some single case in which the verbal insult would be so hard and the physical insult would be so uh, so soft uh, like the opposition to it that the judge would say this is okay and i can imagine that the society would say yes th th that's okay uh, and in such case we would have society uh, which would le legitimize uh, violation of non-aggression principle but i think that in this very extreme and rare case when this happens, uh, I would still call it anarcho-capitalist society. Uh, and the drug laws are of course something absolutely widely different, but I just, and it's possible that I would, maybe when I would see such society, it would very much depend on what the drug laws would it be, how they would be enforced, uh, and so on. You can have many drug laws. Some of them can be absolutely prohibiting 
and some of them would be i don't know when i say something you you can't make drug commercials at schools for example uh and i can imagine some drug laws which i would personally uh consider as so little violation of non-aggression principle that i would still consider that society as anarcho-capitalistic society anarcho-capitalist society but i wouldn't say that this can be objectively measured and i can say th this is really like that I, I would say just to me it seems like anarcho-capitalist society still even if there is some uh, some little violation of non-aggression principle but I also absolutely respect uh, the opinion that the anarcho-capitalist society is only the society where the uh, where any violation of non-aggression principle is not legitimate. But I, I, I don't see it like that. But but I think it's just uh, it's just about the wording. I think this this debate is quite uh, semantic in meaning like um, we are we are discussing the word word meaning but it, it just i think we we just agree on in which society we want to live and the only disagreement between us is just that we are calling one word uh, different yeah yeah I, I understand what you're saying i mean i, I suppose i mean I, I perhaps i would like to push you perhaps for an example of a drug law that that you would feel is tolerable within an anarcho-capitalist society um because i can't f think of one that i would tolerate but but just to go to your point quickly on like with regards to the example of the judge in the case of the person who hit someone who insulted his girlfriend i mean obviously if the level of verbal abuse is, uh, is so extreme to point that it could be classed as like harassment or you know stepping into the lines of some form of aggression then maybe there's a gray area issue but generally speaking you can't hit somebody for what they say and that is a clear violation of the non-aggression principle and if a judge who is supposed to be, you know, presiding over this, decided to because he didn't want to piss off the person or because on his subjective, you know, he's basically going against what he should be doing. He is, you know, it's, it's, and, 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 and to my mind, although it might be less severe and it might be something that we wouldn't care about because maybe we thought the guy deserved it or whatever. Um, yeah, cause the thing is, is like, as much as I agree with the non-aggression principle, I can think of many examples where I myself would violate it in a way that is a clear violation. You know, people could provoke me into hitting them when I'm not really allowed to with regards to my rights because they haven't actually aggressed against me and, and stuff like that. So it's not a case of saying that, like, again, no one is allowed to violate the non-aggression principle, otherwise we're disqualified as being an anarcho-capitalist society. But just the fact that that is viewed as illegitimate like like that anarcho-capitalist society doesn't view that what that judge done as right. And perhaps, for example, another private um, uh, security firm could come in and still prosecute that person who wasn't prosecuted by this other judge because, you know, because they have committed a, a violation. I mean, it's a small one, perhaps, you know, but it's it's one of those ones where I like because the problem is and this is this is the crux of my argument because I do understand what you're saying and I mean don't get me wrong I'd much rather live in a society that's 99.9 percent .9 a free society with yeah. a tiny you know obviously just like I'd much rather live in England than I would Saudi Arabia but it doesn't make England a free society just because okay. there's a worse extreme okay. I, I and agree. go on sorry uh, I agree. I'm sorry to interrupt. Sorry. Oh, uh, well, the, well, the, but the, the crux of my point is we have to have like a line in the sand. We have to have like a, a defining, like for, you know, like for a free market to operate, we have to un have a, some kind of basic consensus of property rights so that, um, you know, f you know, because because how can we trade property if we don't agree who rightfully owns it? You know, if we don't have that. And 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 in my mind, at least, the line we draw is the non-aggression principle. It is the and and the non-aggression principle that follows from the concept of self-ownership, where property rights come from that or are that you know, depending on how you kind of conceptualize it in your own mind. But for me, that's where the line is. And although I certainly agree with you that any violations of the non-aggression principle don't disqualify the entire society as anarcho-capitalist or voluntarist or libertarian or whatever we want to call it or anarchist or whatever um although i do agree with you on that point i i i disagree that that can be uh like a legitimate practice you know like it would have to be viewed as a contradiction a violation uh something that goes against what this society is you know like like if i steal your car 
in an anarcho-capitalist society, it's your car and I've stolen it. I haven't, I'm not now the rightful owner. You know, whereas if we lived in a communist, or oh, actually let's use the communism thing, because you mentioned like voluntary communism. I just wanted to quickly mention that I 100% agree with you about a voluntary communism can exist within anarcho-capitalism or voluntarism. I agree with you 100% on that. I was referring to the more traditional authoritarian communism when I was saying that that would, that if society became like that, we wouldn't call it anarcho-capitalism because it just simply isn't that. Um, and my point is, is, OK, well, if you had a few anarcho-communists in a mostly anarcho-capitalist society and they started stealing houses or factories because they're seizing the means of production or whatever twisted version of property rights they're choosing to exercise, what I'm saying is, is OK, that could happen in an anarcho-capitalist society and it doesn't disqualify the whole society, but it does if the society views that what they're doing as legitimate. If the society doesn't view them as criminals who are going around aggressing against the you know no, what I'm saying? I, I I understand this point. I have well. First, uh, there was good that you mentioned that there are some cases in which you would uh, violate non-aggression principle. Uh, I have it the same. I probably can't be provoked by non-violent way to to non-violent way to hit somebody because uh, I never want to hit people. But uh, I I for example at one of my speeches I got I got a question from the audience. And they asked me if I would uh, steal a medicine which I can't afford to buy and uh, some of my uh, close person is dying. I would steal it. Yeah. Uh, but I would see it as not legitimate action myself. Uh, and I would do it, but then I, even if I would do it, I would say, okay, this wasn't legitimate for me. I, I, I did something which I didn't had any right to do, but I anyway did it. Uh, and this is probably about the difference. You are saying that uh, it's different when the society is like saying, okay, uh, <clears throat> it, it's is wrong, or but I would do it anyway. But uh, but I would say. We as libertarians and anarcho-capitalists and voluntarists are spending a lot of time by thinking about these topics. So uh, I can say, yes, I would steal that medicine, but it's not legitimate act. I think that 90 or more percent of people in the world were never thinking about this and maybe will not ever think about it. So when they are deciding in themselves, like what's legitimate or not, it's usually the equal to what they like or they don't like. Because this is not something like I would, there's not hate on them or, or something like that. It's just, I, I'm just saying, just the majority of society has some other things to do than we, than we so we like to think about this and they are just not thinking about it. So they would probably ask me, I can imagine some people of my family, why, why are you even thinking about it? Why are you even talking about it? It's just quite pointless because, because what? You, you would steal the medicine and it's okay when, when she would be dying that it's okay to steal it because whatever. And uh, <clears throat> I think that in any society, uh, you, will, you will see some acts which would be against the non-violent, uh, the non-aggression principle. And the people would legitimize them just because they are not thinking about it and they are just liking it. They are just uh, empathizing or sympathizing with the with the criminal. So, uh, so I think that if you would really strictly follow what you say, there would be no real anarcho-capitalist society because sooner or later you will always find there some cases which would be uh, which would be uh, against the non-aggression principle and the people would just agree with them not because they would be evil or they would be some bad people but just because they are not thinking about it and uh, if you are saying that it depends on what the society consider as legitimate i would ask a question what is the society? Is it the judges or is it the law enforcers or is it every person in that society? And uh, I think we would get difference 
uh, and we, we, we will get different answers to this question. So uh, I think that in any society you would find some act which would break the no aggression principle, but most of people would find it legitimate, even if just because they don't think about what they, they even don't see the difference between legitimate and I would do it because most of people think that if they would do it and if they feel it as right, it's le legitimate for them. And uh, that's why I don't feel this. Uh, I don't feel this um, uh, this way how to differ the anarcho capitalist society from non anarcho capitalist society as the good way, because it's I think not practically working. And as you said that we have to draw the line to the sand. I. Some years ago I would agree, but. The more the time is going, I don't think that there is always. Some need to have uh, some line in the sand. Because I think that a lot of a lot of things needs to some uh, definitions and uh, to be absolutely absolutely specified because we need the specification for uh, for using them is in praxis. This is all the law is about. But there is a lot of things which are not so often in conflict, and the world is very complicated and complex. And it's much more complicated and complex that uh, then then we would be able to draw so many strict lines. And a lot of things is just not they they don't have uh, straight and uh, bright borders. There, there is just some fuzzy space, as you said, and and the, the gray zone. And I wouldn't be so so much obsessed by always draw the line to the sand, mainly when we are in the situation where all the anarcho-capitalists and even minarchists are still see the same direction we should go in our society. So we can we can talk about where we as anarcho-capitalists would find some exact lines in the sand, and I like such discussion, but uh, for example, the minarchists wouldn't agree with us. Uh, but um, we would still agree with them what we should do in today's society and which which direction we should move. So I don't think there is so much need to have the line in the sand, except of that it can be interesting as a debate. And the last thing I want to ask you is, you said that you are voluntarist, but not anarcho-capitalist. I would like to ask you, what position you have which uh, is making you to not feeling yourself as anarcho-capitalist but uh, feeling yourself as voluntarist? Um, well, I, I think it's partly because I suppose the thing, the reason why I prefer voluntarist to anarcho-capitalist is because voluntarist, it doesn't specify like an economic preference. Now, I do, I do take your point about things like communism and that being able to exist within anarcho-capitalism, um, but um, I, I, I suppose it's more that I find voluntarist a more precise term because it's explicit about what I'm actually identifying with. I'm not identifying because, for example, I'm not identifying with the need for like you know, um, like a say a, a, a market economy. Like like I say, I'm quite happy for people to have communes and, and what have you. And even though I do accept that can exist within the definition of anarcho-capitalism as in being allowed, um, it seems to kind of be. The, the, I think the problem is a little bit with the word capitalism because the, the, the proper definition of a capitalism that I was trying to in my debate with David Friedman about this whole, you know, not allowing drug laws and things is, you know, is just kind of basically private ownership of property, which is really just kind of implied within the overall voluntarism ethos of self-ownership and the non-aggression principle and property rights and all the rest of it. But if we then extend it to things like trade, and stuff like that within the definition, then all of a sudden we're stepping into things that I don't, that I'm not saying has to be the case. You know, like it's it's obvious that in a free society, people are going to be free to trade and that will probably be the optimum way for society to run. But I suppose I'm just focusing on this economically neutral umbrella of voluntarism where you can have an anarcho-capitalist, you could have 
not the anarcho-communists that I encounter, because most of them don't respect the non-aggression principle, but I do meet one or two that do and still call themselves anarcho-communists because they want to they want to pursue collectives and 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 what think for want of a better word, voluntary socialism, you know, and things like that. So I suppose it's more from that point of view. It's like and also because um I'm I'm more prepared to kind of fight over the definition of voluntarism in the sense of saying, okay, you no, know, voluntarism means non-aggression principle and self-ownership. Whereas when I'm having a debate with someone like David Friedman, who says anarcho-capitalism doesn't have to mean that. It can just be decentralized and enough of a market to, you know, enough respect for property rights for a market to function to some degree that we would call it a market, and enough decentralization of authority that we would um, call it anarchist rather than statist um, and he thinks that's enough so rather than debating with him oh well, that's not real anarcho-capitalism I'll just say okay well then I'm not an anarcho-capitalist because anarcho-capitalist can be those things as well which I'm certainly not and actually oppose as much as I oppose statism and kind of view it almost the same thing I, I kind of view like I say the things like the drug laws thing and just and just to touch on your point about like you know, like stealing medicine and stuff like that. Like, again, this is this is fine. And I, I would be with you on that. But again, we would recognize that we stole the medicine. We would recognize that we violated this law. We committed a crime, even if we think it's justified on a higher moral sense. We're still recognizing that we didn't have the technical right. Our self ownership didn't afford us that, you know, so it still seemed as a as an illegitimate act, even if we are you know, feel that, you know, we feel that there's a high morality that justifies, you know, you know, violating these principles or whatever. So it's kind of like it. But the problem is with the drug law thing, just as I know I keep using that because it's a nice, obvious example. But the problem with that, like the way David Friedman was presenting it, and I don't want to straw man him anyway, so I'll try and be as accurate as I can. But the way he was presenting it was basically saying, well, you can have these private enforcers enforcing drug laws. And if another group decided to enforce against those drug law enforcers, like protect the drug users, for example, they would almost be aggressing it because this is the this is the problem with not drawing a line. If we don't draw a line in the sand, then you've got these group of people who think they have the right to enforce drug laws and a poop group of people who recognize that they don't and they're going to be in violent conflict because my little army of private security could go like say you had a little army of private security that's going around enforcing drug laws as far as I was concerned you would be committing a crime and are committing you know committing criminal aggression against people so I'd get my little private security to you know attack your security you'd call it aggression because I'm interfering with what you view as a legitimate practice and I'd call it what you're doing is aggression and I'm just enforcing the law you know you, you know what I'm saying so like I understand about the fuzzy edges and, and as I say I do have an approach to that which I'd like to go into detail with you you know what the Nations of Sanity project presents because it is an issue I'm not pretending it's not an issue that we can't you know we can't draw an objective line this is definitely here and this is definitely that side but I think we can have a fuzzy edge but then draw a line around the fuzzy edge say so, okay this is gray area but at this point you're definitely violating the non-aggression principle and no reasonable person could argue otherwise. It's a little bit like why in criminal law we have that standard of reasonable certainty or, or beyond a reasonable doubt, because we recognise that we can never be absolutely sure, but we can be beyond a reasonable doubt kind of certain. And that's the kind of approach we can apply to identifying the non-aggression principle and whether or not someone is in violation of it. If it's a gray area, perhaps we can say, okay, well, without some kind of prior agreement where we're part of a collective that agrees to mediate within the gray, if we don't have that, then we cannot enforce anything other than the black and white. Unless I'm certain that you've committed an act of aggression, any force I use against you would be criminally reckless because then I'm acting with some kind of aggression. Um, so that's what that's my that's my kind of argument for why, even though I do take your point about the like inescapability of the fuzzy edges and the fact that they are a reality of life. I do still think that we can draw a line, even if we draw a line that still leaves the fuzzy edge. We can't draw a line within it, but we can. And if I could just sorry, I got on a bit, but if I could just illustrate it with a metaphor I like to use. Um, I have an article called Where the Desert Meets the Grassland, and I use this as a kind of metaphor for this whole black and white and grey area thing, because I kind of use the grassland as a metaphor for definitely not violating the non-aggression principle, just exercising your self-ownership as you right, have the right to do. And then the desert is representing you're definitely not allowed to go because that's the violating the non-aggression principle. 
And then the, the grey area in between being represented by the geographical region in between where the the, the desert slowly becomes the grassland or vice versa. You know, it, like if you walk from the grassland towards the desert, there's not going to be an exact line where all of a sudden you've got perfect grass and then all of a sudden you've got desert. It's going to slowly become more arid and then eventually you're in the desert. And what I'm saying is, is OK, well, we can still define the desert in a way that basically all reasonable people can agree. When we're only sand around us, we can say we're definitely in the desert here. And when we're only grass around us, we can say we're definitely in the grassland. And for that in-between area, we can kind of draw a line around it and say, OK, well, it is a grey area. We can accept that. We won't enforce it as law because I can't say for certain if there's still aspects of grassland, even though I think it's kind of like a desert or it's close enough to being a desert that it goes against my sensibilities. Because as a self-owning individual, I don't have any special right beyond you to make that determination. I'm going to be like, OK, well, but when you actually stepped into the desert and it's pure desert, I can say it is pure desert, you know, and and if we don't do that, the problem is, is if we don't do that, keeping the metaphor of the desert or grassland, we lose the complete, we lose the distinction altogether. Do you know what I'm saying? Like if we don't have any line at all where, OK, now you're definitely in the desert. It's like, OK, well, then how do we define the desert at all? If we don't draw a line at some point and say, OK, well, when it's this certain, then we can all agree that you're not allowed to do it. Mm, I have a problem with that. Uh every reasonable person because how you can know who is a reasonable person and who is not a reasonable person and i think that this i agree that we need to differ between grassland and desert absolutely yes but i'm not sure if the if the way how to do that is to draw some line i think we can do some definitions but i'm not sure if the line is needed uh, because the first thing is any reasonable person. You can't say who is and who is not a reasonable person. And the more, more people I am meeting and talking with them about their uh, their opinions to, to non-aggression principle, I see that people can have much, much wider spread of opinions that I would expect. So I suppose that when I would draw some line, after some time, I would find people who would uh, say that the line is not uh, not enough far from the grass or from the sand. And uh, I think that to doing this, like say, OK, you have grass and grassland and desert and there is some some middle uh, and, and then we can draw the line. You are just uh, you are just pushing the problem to the sides because, uh, you know, every like Everybody will say at uh, some other other point, this is definite desert. Uh, so so I think that this is in fact not a solution because you just take one problem and made it smaller. OK, but you are still facing the same problem, but just on some somewhere else, you know, so uh, so I think this, this sure. is and I, I have one. I have one more question, too, because um, I am now confused of your uh, of your voluntarism and anarcho-capitalism because at first, at the beginning of this conversation, you said that uh, all anarcho-capitalists should be voluntarists, but not all voluntarists should be anarcho-capitalists. But then when I asked you, I, I expected that you would uh, tell me example of society which is voluntarist, but not anarcho-capitalist. This would be matching the opinion that every anarcho-capitalist should be voluntarist, but not every voluntarist should be anarcho-capitalist, then I was expecting uh, that you will tell me example of something which is voluntarist, but not anarcho-capitalist. But you gave me opposite example. So from this opposite example, I would uh, I would uh, make opposite conclusion that according to this, uh, every voluntarist should be anarcho-capitalist, but not every anarcho-capitalist should be voluntarist by that your example. Because uh, because if if you are saying that every voluntarist uh, if if you are saying that every anarcho capitalist should be voluntarist, but not every voluntarist should be anarcho capitalist, this implies that there is existing some voluntary society which is not anarcho capitalist. But when you said that, when you said uh, when you are giving opposite example, it is anarcho capitalist society which is not yeah. voluntarist. It would mean opposite. So I am a bit confused of it. And for example, I 
I call myself voluntarist and anarcho-capitalist. I am. I prefer to call myself anarcho-capitalist because I think it's uh, it's more precisely saying uh, what I am. Uh, but I think I I would consider myself as 100% anarcho-capitalist and 100% voluntarist. Just when I say anarcho-capitalism, I think uh, this gives the people more uh, more clue about who I am, because when you say voluntarism, uh, according to my experience, I know voluntarists who are very peacefully talking about it, and they are they are very accepted by people. But I was once at some lesson of such a guy. It's my it's my friend. He was talking very very nicely about anarcho-capitalism. From voluntary point of view, I agreed in any word with him. Everything what he said, I would I, I would sign. But then I was talking with some somebody who came to that uh, to that lesson, and he was listening to it, and he basically went out with that it's democracy, uh, and it's a state, but some voluntary state. Uh, but he he just didn't get the point because when you say voluntary, everybody said yeah yeah. Everybody, everything should be volunt voluntary, but they somehow don't see what, what is not voluntary in fact on the state. When I say I'm anarcho-capitalist, most people said, oh my God, what is this anarchist or capitalist, both terrible. But then when I talk to them and we somehow agree, I usually know that we really agreed on what, what we are. So I prefer this term, but I would really like to know what why do you differ this? Because I don't clearly understand what what difference do you see in this in this book? Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, although I do agree with you that an, an, a a commune or communist style society, as long as it was voluntary, could exist within an anarcho-capitalist society, that communist society itself would not be anarcho-capitalist. So like, let's say, say the whole society just became like communist, but it was all voluntary. So for me, that's still voluntarism, but that I would struggle to describe that society as anarcho-capitalism. I wouldn't fight too hard over it because it would depend on the definition. But the problem is, is like I say, like capitalism, if, if it was only about property rights and respecting property rights, as yeah, maybe that should be its definition. And then it is almost the same as voluntarism. But the problem is, is for many people, it also means trade. Like, you know, and, and like my debate with David Friedman kind of demonstrated that you can have someone saying, well, anarcho-capitalism can not be voluntarist. And, you know, like obviously he takes a different view. So, so I suppose it was like, rather than being possessive over the term anarcho-capitalism saying, no, it means this, and this is what I am. I'm like, okay, well, maybe it can mean that as well. In which case I'm not an anarcho-capitalist because I'm not that. I'm only the voluntarist side of it. I'm only an anarcho-capitalist if they're also a voluntarist. I'm only an anarcho-capitalist if capitalism only means respect for property rights and doesn't even require an actual trading market. Like people could just ha decide to live in a this more communistic. So that's what that's kind of what I meant about it. I mean, I, I would like if someone called me an anarcho-capitalist, it wouldn't offend me in any kind of way. You know, I would just sort of clarify their definition perhaps a little bit. And you need to do that with anything, even with voluntarism, as you say. I, I, everything we all the words have some kind of potential for being misunderstood. But I think anarchism and capitalism are probably the two worst words for being misunderstood and misrepresented. And all the different things that people invoke when they hear anarchism and capitalism is quite far away from what I'm talking about. So I like to lead with voluntarism because it doesn't tell them everything that I'm representing, but at least doesn't give them too many misrepresentations. They're not going to start thinking of slavery like they might do with capitalism, because although that's ridiculous that people do associate it because there was the slave trade, then mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And, and it's like things and, you know, an anarchism, the whole chaos thing, uh, you know, a voluntary society doesn't have to be a chaotic one where there's no hierarchies. We can have voluntary hierarchies. We can have, you know, and, and we can still have law if it's only the non-aggression principle because that's justifiable uses of force. And, you know, so it's like that's that. Yeah, that I hope that kind of explains it a bit better. Uh, I absolutely I absolutely agree. And I'm very happy that uh, there are people who prefer the word voluntarism over the anarcho-capitalism because I think that we both can hit another uh, target group uh, because I'm usually 
I see it even in Czech Republic. We are, we are here a very big uh, libertarian society. Our libertarian and anarchic scene is, in Czech Republic is really, really big. And we are even hitting some main medias here. So uh, you can even with this opinion, uh, you, I, I could present this opinion in, in very big medias in Czech Republic already. So so here it's, it, it's, it's possible and, and I, I like it very much. And I like very much that uh, there are some people like me who are presenting themselves as anarcho-capitalists. It's very much visible on in this room where I'm sitting. And uh, and it's it's nice that uh, we can be here by people who are open to different thoughts, let's say, and, and they are very much open minded. Uh, so we can talk to them and we can be very specific and very radical. I don't know if, if I can say it like that. And we have also here anarcho-capitalists who, who are basically never even using the words anarcho-capitalism on public. And they are they are doing very great job by talking about it, not even saying the word and not even saying anything what would, uh, what would make the people hate them. So uh, I, I know people here who are, are anarcho-capitalists. I know it because they, they taught me they even identify themselves as anarcho-capitalists, but then you see him to talk as as big economist in medias, and he would never use the word, and he's not even saying, I don't know, abolish the state, but he is saying very good things which people are uh, like to listen, and then they are even closer to, for example, to listen to me who are too much radical or extreme to them. So I, I am happy that, that that there are people who prefer the anarcho-capitalism and there are people who prefer the prefer the voluntarism, because I think that the voluntarists are like more likely accepted accepted by society, as you said. Yeah, uh, yeah, especially people of shall we say a left-wing persuasion, because they've got such an aversion to words like capitalism, and and they would view that as just right-wing, and they're like, well, I'm left-wing, so I can't do with. with anarcho-capitalists because they're right -wing. whereas I suppose voluntarism just seems more neutral in a left-right sense although generally speaking as I say like I, I've, I've encountered anarcho-capitalists or people who call themselves anarcho-capitalists and I've encountered people who call themselves anarcho-communists and anarcho-communists who are voluntarists are very very rare they're almost like unicorns but most anarcho-capitalists are voluntarists and have a decent understanding of property rights and the non-aggression principle. But yeah, so so part of, I mean, yeah, part of it is a little bit of a market employee as well in regards to trying to make myself more and what I'm, the ideas I'm presenting more kind of neutral and universally appealing. Because I do think there's common grounds, um, you know, from if, 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 if we want to kind of categorise people of being left or right, leaning in some sense and I don't think people are 100% in either camp in that sort of way but you know like people that have kind of you know we have common grounds with both that we can kind of open the door to you know if I'm talking to somebody if you're talking to somebody who's say a right-wing status like a conservative or someone like that you might be able to appeal to them and move them towards anarcho-capitalism or voluntarism by talking about property rights and how important that is in the free market and stuff like that and they'd be very receptive to what you're talking about they'd probably be less receptive if you led with say your opposition to the drug laws for example because they you know and it, but you have the opposite experience with a left winger he would be very more receptive because you generally get less less support for drug laws and things like that from the left whereas right wingers tend to be you know, certainly if they're not anarchists certainly tend to be more supportive of things like that because it goes against their traditionalist values or whatever so you know there's 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 common ground that we can kind of reach with both sides and i do feel that the anarcho capitalist uses at least one word that kind of excludes one side of yes know, I, I i agree with this i don't uh, i don't consider myself as left wing i don't consider myself as uh, right wing i don't consider myself as none of this because with both of them i have something is co in common and with both of them i have uh, something which is n not not so much compatible and I think that the left and right wing uh, sort is doing a lot of bad things among people because everybody is imagining something else under that. And I also am very sorry for the for the libertarian fight inside of the community 
it's uh, a lot of uh, on the worldwide scene, uh, like the Tucker against Hope. And uh, but on the other hand, it's also inside of, for example, our country, there are also, uh, let's say, very conservative uh, libertarians and very progressive libertarians. And I'm just saying, wow, we are libertarians, so we ha can have co like some common goal and uh, we can we can follow that that goal and because property rights are giving us the freedom to to live but it's obviously not working this easy and i see that a lot of uh, a lot of conservative anarcho capitalists or libertarians are very much hating the uh, progressivist anarcho capitalists and libertarians and vice versa so uh, i think it's uh, it's quite pity that, uh, that this is happening and uh, I'm also I'm also criticized by quite both of that uh, both of the wings that there are even some there are some really right wing libertarians who are saying that I'm the progressivist because I'm not against the gay marriage and I, I, I don't know what and there are some left wing uh, le left wing uh, let's say bleeding heart libertarians who are saying that I am the stinky capitalist. So uh, I think that you're right. That it's very important to talk to both of the sides and show them what we have in common and then try to, for example, show them something more <coughs> what, 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 what we can share. And I very much don't want to be considered if as left wing, left wing or right wing, because I don't think that libertarianism or voluntarism or anarcho-capitalism is about left or right wing. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I just think that capitalism is associated with the right wing, um, obviously and with socialism. Capitalism is the left wing. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, no, I, I understand that. Um, but, um, but yeah, I suppose it's like, again, like it is partly a market employee for, in a way to kind of you know broaden ourselves out and it's like you know the political i'm sure you're familiar with the political compass the four-way line where you yeah where you've got left and right and then you've got authoritarian and and okay. libertarian or whatever and i suppose what i'm trying to do with this whole voluntarism banner which is more likely to be embraced by both left and right wing people than say anarcho-capitalism even though i do agree with you that it's neither left or right to you know to be that um and i suppose it's like if you think of the two lines, we've got the line that divides the left and the right, and then we've got the line that divides the, say, the voluntarists from the statists. I guess I'm trying to get people to focus on the line that, div that divides the voluntarists from the statists rather than the div line that divides the left and the right, because I'm like, look, we, we've got a common ground under voluntarism, whereas, you know, you know, where, so if we can kind of and recognise that the line we should be drawing is the line that separates us from people who you know who are basically statist or you know willingly supporting the state um and I, and again that does harken back to my I, that that need for some kind of defining line in the sand I, I do take your points about how difficult that is to draw um the only thing i do do think about that um like with the desert grassland thing is i, I do think we can do it to a certain extent and just when I say about reasonable, it's not about calling the person reasonable because i meet i know lots of reasonable people that say or think unreasonable things and with a long enough conversation you can often show them that and they can see that for themselves so it's not about you know it's not like saying oh you're an unreasonable person if you think that but it's about saying look it's not reasonable to think that drug laws for example is legitimately enforceable law it's not a reasonable interpretation of the non-aggression principle and likewise we can say to someone who's standing in the middle of the desert without grass anywhere to be seen we can say it's not reasonable for you to say this is grassland but if they're standing where they can point to some defining feature and all we have to do to draw this kind of universal line is just have a basic consensus of reality we don't like i say we don't have to we don't have to define within the fuzzy edges but we can kind of define outside of the fuzzy edges where it's where we can say it's not fuzzy anymore because as we define the desert as and how we define the grassland and how we distinguish one from the other, we can use those definitions to draw the line. Because say we define the grassland as you know being obviously a land full of grass and we divide the desert of being a land just full of sand. 
when we're in the area in between, the reason why we know it's a grey area is because someone can point to that reasonable doubt over either definition by saying, well, look, there's something there's there's something there that that's not part of that definition and is part of that and then there's something there that's not part of that definition you know we you can build that case and I understand what you're saying about it, it does feel like it's kicking the can down the road a little bit because you're just moving the problem to a different line but the thing is is I think I feel like that's a line we have the right to draw we have a right to draw a line where we're saying okay as a matter of basic reality this is the desert if we're agreeing that there is such a thing as a desert obviously it still still presupposes that we're agreeing you know because some people can say there's no such thing as a desert or grassland it's all you know people can the thing is people can pick apart our conceptualization of reality itself to the point where they can say you know there's no distinction between a child and adult there's no distinction between a, a rock and a, and, and a person there's no distinction between anything because it's all just energy and it's all just quantum flux you know what I'm saying is is we have a basic consensus of reality even if it's pretty basic and wh where we can draw a sort of line in the sand where we can say okay to a reasonable certainty which isn't you know making ad hom attacks against anyone who disagrees with us saying they're unreasonable but we can say that they don't have a reasonable case against this line being drawn here they can't tell me that at this point it's still grassland because they can't point to anything that gives them that reasonable doubt you know does that make sense well, well we definitely have the right to draw the line the question is if we if it's good to do that and uh, if you are using the if you are using the example with the desert and the grassland <clears throat> let's say a few years ago i would absolutely agree with you because if i would see a person in a desert and he would tell me it's a grassland i would definitely say you're just wrong this is objective desert but now i would first let's say give it some time and ask the person why is he calling this grassland and uh, we can assume that he is wrong but it's also good to assume that we might be wrong and it's very good to have a discussion with that person and the person might show us some let's say some grass we just didn't see before and uh, i think this is the problem with the lines it's not that we wouldn't have the right to draw the lines it's okay to draw the line but my the way how i am thinking i'm trying to change it from drawing the lines to be more skeptical to um, to fall into some into some bias if some person would be standing behind the line and would tell me i'm in grassland i would be much more tending to say you are wrong. If there is no line and somebody would tell me I'm in grassland and I would assume it's desert, I would be much more willing to listen his arguments. Why is he consider himself to be standing on grassland? So my problem with lines in the sand is not that we wouldn't have rights to draw them. My problem with them is that I don't consider them as healthy for my mindset because since I draw the line, I somehow put some border to my mind also. And after drawing the line, I am much less suspicious to do some to do some conclusions which can be which can be wrong. And as long as there are no lines, Anybody who is telling to me I'm in the grassland, I'm in the desert, I am much more willing to listen to him. What is he really saying to me and why he's considering himself to be standing on grassland or, or desert? But as long as the line is there, I I am much more tending to just look on which side of the line, uh, line he is standing. Uh, and I look much more on the on the side of the line than on what he's actually telling me. So <clears throat> I'm not saying to not draw line, do not draw lines. I just think I want to live in this mindset, which is as much lines free as possible. And 
I was really drawing lines in my life very much. And by the time I don't find it as so good for me, I'm not saying that it's also bad for you. I, I can't say anything about your mindset and your life, but I think I am. My nature is to draw too many lines, so I'm trying to just not do it. I, I understand that. And to be honest, I actually agree with your, your point to a, to a large extent there because I, 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 and I and I do I do see the need and and agree with the need to limit this line drawing and and uh, but the reason why I think that there is a difference between drawing lines within the grey area and drawing this line within what we're calling the black and white and why it's so important to have this invoke this um, demand for reasonable certainty is to to allow like you know because the end of the day like this beyond reasonable doubt that kind of implies that you have to allow the person to present potential evidence that you're wrong in your assertion that he's over that line or look there is some grass How, over here let me show you or let me show you that this sand is actually covering a whole oasis or whatever you know it's like that's you know because that's part of this demand for reasonable certainty and that's why i think it's different because when we're saying because because by saying look we can't draw lines in the gray area because if we accept the premise of self-ownership and the non-aggression principle as our presupposition if we accept that then we're all equal so no one really has any divine right if we're admitting that it's a gray area no one has a divine right to go in there and say no here 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 but if we're going to have definitions like you know like of what is a desert and what is a grassland and we're going to agree that there's a distinction between one and the other and it matters when you enter one or the other then at some point we have to draw a line and while we can't draw a line within this you know uh, ambiguous region where there's qualities of both because we don't have the authority to do that when it gets to that point of saying okay well now you're definitely in a you know because with them we're making a kind of more for sure you know it's, it's more reality based it's more fact based it's more we're demanding that reasonable certainty and by doing that i think we're setting a higher bar for when we use force against people because we're saying to people okay because the problem is is if if we allowed for people to draw lines within the gray area and this is where i kind of agree with your point about the problem of drawing lines all over the place is people are going to draw, draw lines in different places and if you imagine this kind of you know desert and grassland and this area in between if we're allowing people to draw lines in between they're going to be crossing over each other's lines because they're not going to be able to agree on there while it's still possible that you might have a few people wandering into the objective desert and still calling it grassland they're going to be rare they're going to be rightly viewed as some kind of delusion or some kind of problem they're not recognizing the existence the distinction between it as a grassland or you know there's some kind of issue and not we're not saying it's not about whether we're calling them reasonable or unreasonable but there's no reasonable argument they can make for saying they're in the grassland based on even the most basic and universal definition of what is a desert and grassland and it's the same thing with that's what i'm trying to do with the non-aggression principle and this idea of of establishing it as like this kind of universal law is saying okay well we to create a universal standard like we're like creating a universal definition of what the desert is and a universal definition of what the grassland is and saying okay well the area in between we're just not going to enforce that and if people want to voluntarily collectivize and have standards where they agree to have like you know like like say for example like you might be in this area in between that I feel is too close to the desert for my comfort, but because I can't say for certain you're in the desert, I can't use force against you, but I'm going to choose to have nothing to do with you and not be in the same collective as you and all the rest of it. And I'm going to be a part of a collective that has higher standards or, you know, and whatever. But my point is, is when we're talking about law, we're talking about violence or threats of violence and, and, and when we're talking about law how I'm presenting it with this nation's sanity project is because I basically basically the idea is I want to say that we should establish the non-aggression principle as the terms of peace as the law through a peace agreement like no one has the authority as ruler but we can say that based on the concept that everyone owns themselves then the only justifiable use of force is you know enforcing the non-aggression principle so from my point of view just like we can just like it is possible to have a universal definition of what the desert is and what the grassland is and the distinction between them and still acknowledge the grey area in between and just not enforce that as law allow that to be negotiated peacefully uh, you know as, as equally free individuals but we still need to draw a line at some point like I, I don't think we can avoid lines altogether because we have to have some kind of distinction at a certain point 
we have to be able to say, no, 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 that's aggression. That's 100% aggression. And while you're prepared to point to evidence that it's not and, and prove me wrong, because I have to have a reasonable certainty that you're violating the non-aggression principle before I use force against you, otherwise, um, you know, my force is, is criminally reckless, then... You know, I, I just feel like if we give, if we give that standard, I, sp I suppose, and just my, just my closing point on this is, what I'm saying is, is we can't escape. I do acknowledge, because I keep using the word objective, and it does uh, rub people the wrong way sometimes because it's like, well, how can you say things are objective? Because we can't escape subjectivity 100. percent You know, everything's down to human perception, but we can minimise it. We can be as objective as possible. You know, we can be. Um, we can draw, like I said, we can we can draw a line that creates standards that's like um, beyond reasonable doubt. And it's not an exact science, but we I feel like we're minimizing the area of conflict. And if we don't draw a line and say, OK, this is as far as you can go with regards to differing interpretations. You know, we, we can because we, if I understand that you and me are equal and we've got an area that where there's like a grey area. And OK, well, this is up for debate, but I, I I think, you know, you're wrong, but I can acknowledge that there's some kind of reasonable doubt. Then we're basically saying as our universal terms of peace, as our agreement that we're both equally self-owning individuals, I can't impose my specific interpretation in the grey area, but I can impose the black and white because it is the black and white. Sorry, I went on. The problem is that as you are saying in this, it sounds nice in theory. But it's like our ago when you said that Rosbard was objectively wrong in saying that uh, intellectual property is property. Uh, I agree with you that I also think that Rosbard was wrong in this, and I don't agree with Rosbard. I am I, I am against intellectual property to be considered as property. However, uh, you say this is objectively wrong. But I don't know how it's worldwide, but in Czech Republic, you have, I don't know, 10 percent or something like that, libertarians who are saying that intellectual property is property. And I, I know some of them and I now I have in my mind at least one of Czech libertarian who is saying that intellectual property is property and I can't say his arguments are unreasonable. I don't agree with them. I think he's wrong. But I wouldn't say that the things he's saying are not reasonable because I it's it's not like total nonsense. It has some structure, it has some logic behind it, and it's, it's just like Could you give an example of a legitimate argument for intellectual property rights? I know you don't agree with it, but like an example of yes. where you think, OK, uh, well, OK, uh, uh, th this guy is saying that uh, li like my my main argument why we shouldn't use uh, we shouldn't take intellectual property as a property is that uh, if you would have some intellectual property, you would be in some way the owner of all the physical property, because if you, for example, have an intellectual property of a book, then you automatically are partial owner of all printers and uh, papers and and so on. And this is my main argument. I have more argument against intellectual property, but this is my main argument. And, and I think this is the most common, the, the most common argument. But this guy is, uh, he told me, well, as I have the ownership of my body, nobody can stop me with a knife then. So I am partial owner of all the knives in the universe. And this is, I don't agree with it. And I can, I can describe here how the, how the, uh, how the discussion went then. But I wouldn't say it's absolutely unreasonable on the first view. And, and the, I can't say that there is no reasonable doubt. I, I think that intellectual property is not a property, but I don't think I can say I have no reasonable doubt. And, uh, the problem is that, OK, you, you can draw lines, but if you told me some time ago that intellectual property is objectively wrong, I absolutely don't see where the line would be 
if for example we would you would say okay intellectual property is 100 percent desert for me it's also desert but still 10 percent libertarians not even speaking of 99.9 percent .9 of all other people would say this is grassland and uh, i i see this is as a this is a problem because uh, i i can see for example that somebody have just no argument he has just feeling okay but well i wouldn't say just but he has some feelings about it but he has no arguments but you can see people who has they, they have arguments and they are uh, they are defending the intellectual property for example so is the intellectual property for you sand or the uh, or the gray area um no it's, it's, it's sand it's black and white because uh, although i do i see where he i mean he's made a very clever argument against your argument um but i think it, he hasn't really defended why intellectual property is valid he's really just picked a hole in that specific argument that you've made by saying oh well if i use the same logic as that then i can say this you know with regards to um, my ownership over other people's use of knives because they're not allowed to stab me with it. But I don't, I mean, although I thought your, your argument was, I hadn't actually heard it that way, but yeah, I mean, that's a good way of putting it, but he can come back to you with the counter that he came back to you. The way I kind of put it more is, you know, like if I steal your car, then I've taken your car from you. If I steal your idea, so steal, I put in quotes, steal your idea, I haven't taken anything from you. You still have your idea. Like, like the thing is, is about um, stealing actual property, like you know, real tangible property. Is the ing the aggression involved in taking that? If I can magically copy your car without actually taking it from you, like if I had some machine that just like magically just you know done it without you know then it's like where's your complaint you know where's your complaint that i've aggressed against you whereas if i take your actual physical property then you can make the claim that i've aggressed against you but if i take your idea i don't see where your argument is from a point of view of self-ownership which is where all the property rights come from essentially uh let's have a bit conversation about this topic uh i am i agree with you i I think that intellectual property is not a property, but I would try to defend it here for a while and then we can see if this is somehow beyond our reasonable, uh, reasonable doubts. Uh, it's true that if you take my car, I lose my car, but if you take my book, I don't lose my book and I don't mean the paper book, I mean the, the idea, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course, that's true. On the other hand, uh, if I step on your yard, you also don't lose your yard. And then I go away. And if you didn't even notice that, uh, I you didn't lost anything. And still, I definitely uh, violated your property. So if I, you said, don't walk on my yard, I did it anyway. You didn't see me there. You didn't even know that I was there it's still violating of uh, your property and uh, you didn't uh, lost anything. So I think this argument with that uh, in the case of the stealing car, uh, it's not, I, I, I just told you another example when I can break your property obviously and you are not losing anything. So I think this is uh, anti argument against that one. Um, well, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. I mean, but the thing is, is you still have physical, you know, you, like you, like you still, um, like, you know, because the thing is, if you trespass on my property, but I didn't know you did it and you didn't cause any damage and all the rest of it, then you could be like, oh, well, no harm, no foul. But you did trespass on my property. And if I see it, and if you did do it when I did see you, I could view it as some kind of threat. I would have right to, you know, demand that you leave immediately. And if you refused, I could push you off and use proportionate reasonable force and all that sort of stuff. It's like, um, I, yeah, I, 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 understand the, I understand the argument you're making, but it's like, there is still a violation there because we're accepting that it's your property and I'm not allowed to use it. So stepping onto it is, you know, using it, let's say. Um, but, there, there, you know, there's obviously severity and all the rest of it. And if you can't really point to any damages, it's difficult to claim much from me. So it's it's more about it's more about um, it's kind of like, let's say I pushed you. 
that's an act of aggression. That's a non, non that's a violation of non aggression principle. But it's so small that there's not much you could do other than maybe push me back justifiably. Um, if I walked away, you say, well, I need something done against this person. It's like, like that. It's like, okay, well, people go to him and say, you're not allowed to do that. And, you know, we'll use force against you to stop you and, and all the rest of it. But it's hard to think of, of, a, of a proportionate response that would be justified. But technically, he still violated you. He still done something that, you know, like he, he done. What I'm saying is, is like, if I, if I copy your book, yeah, the point you make about, okay, well, there's just like if I walked onto your property and then I walked off, you didn't even know about it. So there's no real harm that you can point to. There is a still a physical violation. You just didn't know about it and the, there was no harm left and the violation was so small that you didn't even notice and, and, and all the rest of it. Um, so it's, it, it seems to tie more to severity. But if I take your book, it doesn't matter like, you know, what I do with it. It's like, like I, I've, yeah, I, I I know what you're saying, but it's like like because the thing is, is we've we've established that the property is your property, and somebody is not allowed to trespass on it. Sorry, I'm I'm having difficulty with this argument. Actually, I, I will admit because it's it's difficult to articulate exactly exactly why. But I suppose because the way I conceptualize it in my head, my own head, I start with self ownership. I say that's our only presupposition is that we have right over ourselves. But then that right then gives us the right for to property. You know, because we can create property that we have a better right over somebody else. You know, like you know that lake over there, we have equal right to use it because it's not either of our property. But if I build a house then I built that house and that's the product of you know that is my property and I have that exclusive right um so it's not so so there is this so it's the issue of what you have a right to now saying oh um like I don't have a right to go into your property because it is your property now I might be able to do that in a way that's small and unnoticeable and 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 and, and little to no harm comes of it so the violation is very very small and almost trivial but it's still technically a violation. The, the, the problem is, is when you have an idea, like you, you, you can't, it, like, it's like you, you can't own an idea because to, 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 to copy your idea is just an exercise of my self ownership. I'm not, I'm not using your property. I haven't trespassed onto your property. So I understand what you're saying that your counter argument does kind of, give a counter to my argument about oh well I could use it and it's not harmed you because you've still got your property just like you've still got your property if I trespassed on it but I did trespass on it. I did step on it you know there is there is I did I did in I did go beyond where my right is but when I'm using an idea that's because the thing is once you put that idea out there it's different if I broke into your house and took your idea that way you know like if i, uh, like, I know, but uh, i think this is this is a bit circular argument uh, okay. because uh, because i can say the same with the intellectual property i can say i derive the intellectual property from property of my body because because i have my body i think out the book i uh, i thought out the text so i thought out, out the text and now uh, you can come and uh, copy it uh, and you are saying that you didn't violate my rights, but you didn't violate my rights if we are uh, if we are getting if we are um, if we are assuming that the right is only the physical property and the not intellectual property. But you can't assume this if you want to defend it. So you can't say. Uh, as an argument that uh, that you didn't break my physical property because you brought my intellectual property. So if you want to if you want to show that the inter intellectual property is not a property, you can't uh, you can't use it as uh, as assumption uh, assumption or I don't know how it's the verb. Uh, and uh, I want to say one more thing. Uh, the harm is subjective, and I am not. Uh, I am not uh, showing the trespassing as a little harm. If you would be a person who would be, for example, obsessive on his uh, on his uh, property, or I would be the person you really hate, and I would be the person you absolutely don't want there. The harm does not need to be little. Uh, so it can be even the trespassing can be even harming a lot. Uh, as well as the intellectual property, 
it both can do a lot of harm. And the point is that in the trespassing, you are not losing any of your property. So th this was just, uh, you said that when I steal your car, uh, yeah. I know that there is a problem with the, uh, with the scarcity. Uh, there, there is a problem with the scarcity and there is not problem with the scarcity in the intellectual property. On the other hand, uh, we don't have scarcity problem in uh, case of trespassing uh, somewhere where you you are not because the the harm would be then just even uh, your harm would be probably just even mental and not not physical because when I trespass it and for example you don't see me there but you find out later you can have big mental harm but no physical harm so. Uh, yeah, but it's still the thing is, is in the case I, I do take your point, and 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 it is quite a clever argument. But the, the the thing is, is like in the case of the trespass, it's still there. It's still. I mean, I suppose it does come a little bit down to our conceptualization of reality. That's and we still need a consensus of reality. What is property, and and all the rest of it. But the thing is, is it's. I'm still. If I trespass on your property, regardless of how big or small we want to view the violation. Or whether there's so-called harm, the fact of the matter is, is it's your that the property is still your tangible property, still your scarce resource, and I don't have right to use it. It's a little bit like I don't have right to break into your car, or let's say not break into your car, but get into your car. Let's say you didn't lock it. Oh, and copy my book. Well, yeah, but the thing is, is like, well, yeah, but the thing is, is like, if I touched your book, no, then I've I my book uh, without uh, breaking. The, the idea, yeah, I mean, I suppose it comes down to the ba basically saying that ideas aren't property. You know, I understand that sounds a bit circular because I'm saying, oh, well, it's not property because it's not property kind of thing. Yeah, so I, I get I get you what you're saying about the flaw in my argument. I think, I mean, I mean, to be honest, I think the failings here is on me rather than on the argument, <laughs> me not doing a very good job of presenting it. But it's basically like, you know, if the point is, is like, I don't have a right to your scarce property. Like I don't have the right to burn your house down. Obviously, the same that same thing that says I don't have a right to your property because it's your property, it's your scarce property. Also says I don't have a right to trespass on it. Now, whether or not I cause harm, whether or not you knew I did it, whether or not it's a small violation is a side point to the fact that I don't have that right. But I do have the right to um, uh, to take in any idea that's been put out because the thing is once you put an idea out there you've put it out there it's like it's like saying i don't have right to breathe the air that you expelled it's like you put it out there you you um you did that you know like you released it out and it's not a tangible it's not a tangible property that i can take from you or even touch that i don't have a right to touch you know it's it's uh it's it's too abstract to be I can say to this, okay. as long as you don't have their guard, as long as you don't have their offense, and it's just a yard, which is uh, which is freely passable, you just put it there, you let, left it there, and I just went there because nobody stopped me, and because you did nothing to protect it, and you just left it there. And uh, I, I'm, I am not saying that I believe what I'm telling you. No, that, I, I but, understand your plain devil's advocate. the same advocate, argument yeah. that you said that you expelled the air, uh, you left there your uh, idea, so I can use it. In the same way, I can say you left there your, right, uh, your yard, it's unprotected, there is no fence, there is no guard. I just knew it's yours, yours, because you told me it's yours. And so I went there and I, because you just told me it's yours, but you, you didn't put there any anything which would stop me. It's the same like I would tell it's my idea, but you used it because you think you have no, uh, you think you have right to do it. So I can think that I have the right to uh, trespass on your right because on your yard because you you it's just like yours, like my book. Yeah. Okay. The difference is is I'm acknowledging. I assume I am, correct me if I'm wrong, but in this example, I'm acknowledging that it is your tangible property that I've trespassed on. I'm obviously making the argument that you're, you're, you're only because you're declaring it, but I'm assuming that, like, because the thing is, is, is if, we, if we can both agree that it is your property, then we can both agree that there's a trespass. Just, it's not like, it's not your property just because you say it's your property. 
otherwise you could use the same argument for your book and say oh well it's my idea so that's my property just because you it's not it's not because you said it's your property that declares it property it's like you know a, a consistent application of property rights that says it's your property because you know you built that house or okay. bought it off the person who built it or whatever so what i'm saying is if he's saying if he's acknowledging that that's your property that he doesn't have a right to and acknowledging that it would be a crime if he say burnt it to the ground or or took it from you or excluded you from it all of those things are acknowledgement that it's that it's your property so even if he actually did take it you, you know if he's saying if he did take his only argument really is that he's not he's not actually done any harm to it but by acknowledging that it's your property he's acknowledging that he doesn't have a right to it so he's acknowledging there's an offense in his but trespass I can, say, where, sorry, go on. I can say as long as you copied my book i don't think uh you are a legitimate owner of your right of your yard i can like you are you are argumenting that I acknowledged your property, but I, as a, a defender of intellectual property, I can say, I, I agree with the property. I, I acknowledge property just of people who has the same uh, the same perspective perspe perception of property as I do. And if you don't, I don't. Uh, as well as I am now really saying that I don't think that the state is the legitimate owner of quite anything, because uh, the state is so much violating uh, non-aggression principle that uh, is just not uh, not legitimate owner. I can say the same with this. As long as you are so much not uh, respecting the intellectual property, I don't need to respect your yard. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, they're not really making a principle-based argument. They're just kind of bribing or blackmailing the other person to say well if you don't do this i won't do that kind of thing my, my, my point is is like what i'm saying is, is if the other person like the, the trespasser will admit that he's not allowed to steal that property he's not allowed to burn it to the ground he acknowledges that it is the other person's property if we we're, we're, if we work from that son obviously if he's disputing that the guy has rightful claim over it like he would be with the intellectual property then that's a different thing but we're assuming that the trespasser because because the thing is is like in the case of the intellectual property the reason why I, the, let's put it this way the reason why i can't trespass on your property but i can take your book is because i acknowledge that your property is your property i couldn't exclude you know i couldn't take it from you i couldn't do what i wanted with it because it's your property and my, and my argument that i sorry my argument that i can trespass on it because you didn't know or it's small or you've still got it afterwards or whatever doesn't hold water to the fact that i've already acknowledged that it's your property which implies that i don't have a right to it but i'm not i'm not accepting the idea that your ideas are your property yes you but but then, uh, then I can tell you when a communist don't accept that the yard is your property, he can go there. Uh, but I don't think you think this. So I don't think you use that argument against me, uh, because if you use against me that argument that if I acknowledge your property, then I can't go there. It also means that if I and you if you don't acknowledge my book property, you can copy it then you would have to also agree with that if communists don't uh, acknowledge your yard and your house as your property, he can go there and take it. So I think this argument is invalid. Just, just, to, just to, yeah, I understand what you're saying, but just to clarify my argument, I wasn't saying that because I don't recognize your property right, that gives me the right to violate it. That wasn't the crux of my argument. I was just saying that because I, I was saying it from the other point of view, I was saying that because I do recognize your property right, as in like I do recognize that it should, then I can't trespass on it, even if that trespass doesn't do any larging damage. Obviously, so I'm not saying that it's down to whether or not I agree with your property rights. I'm, I'm, I'm saying, because I'm saying we can still deduce that somewhat objectively from the concept of self-ownership. Like, like what I'm saying is, is like the commie who wants to come and take my house doesn't have a legitimate argument for saying that it's not my house or that he has a right to take it. You know, like based on self-ownership, I can assert my property rights and say, no, you know, you don't have a right over this to me because it's I created it. If we're all, if we, Again, this is on the presupposition of self ownership. Like nothing. But what if, if I would, uh, based on my self ownership, say that uh, the book is my property? Yeah, I, but what I'm so sorry, go on. What if I would say the same way as you are saying to the communist that he can't go to your property because yet your property is derived from your self ownership? What if I tell you that the property of my book, uh, the, I mean the text of it, uh, is also derived from my self-ownership because I created it. 
Right. Okay. Yeah. Um. Yeah. But that's not the. Uh, yeah. Okay. But that's not the only. I mean, that's a good counter to that one point. But that's not the only thing that makes it aggression for me to take your property. Like, it's not. It's not just your property because you created it. Although. So what? What are other points? Well, well, I mean, the other thing as well. Did, did you really create it? Because this is this is the other thing. It's like the problem with ideas is they're not tangible. They're not like they're abstract. You know, it's like it's like if I create a physical object that someone can, because 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 the thing is, it's whether you take it or whether you just use it without my permission, like tr like a trespass would technically be using my property without my permission. Like either way, with, what I'm saying is, is with with the whole idea of self ownership being able to create some tangible property that I have exclusive right to and others don't. What I'm saying is, is the reason that doesn't work with ideas is because ideas aren't tangible property. Like it's it's I suppose I, I suppose from my point of view, I find it hard like like because I do see where you're coming from with a lot a lot of these counterpoints do counterpoint like a specific argument. Like if I say, oh well that's my property because I created it, you can say, well Okay, that's my idea because I created it. Or if I say that I can um, copy your book without depriving you of your book, you can say, well, I can step on your yard without depriving you of your yard. Like you can counter these specific points on an individual level, but the overall, um, the overall, um, the overall definition of property that we're deriving from self-ownership and property rights and the non-aggression principle that kind of multi-dimensioned definition of what is property and what is rightfully owned property which comes from self-ownership i don't i like to, to argue I, I don't see how you can apply all of those factors to ideas because you don't like you don't have the aggression from taking it from you know you can't take it from me it's not like a phys it's not a physical thing it's like you know it's it's not um, interesting, but I, I think you are you are uh, you are saying that from the definition of non-aggression principle, I can't do that. But I of course change the definition. This is this is not the, we can use it as the we can. It, it will be cyclic as a circle argument yeah. because, because uh, my definition in this discussion is that I can own physical objects and I can own own non-physical objects and. I am saying that I can, from my self ownership, derive my uh, what I created physically, also what I created mentally, and uh, <clears throat> like your definition says that you can own only physical objects, and my definition said I can own physical objects and even uh, intellectual or uh, mind objects. Yeah, and. Uh, so you, you can't use this definition in any way as an argument because you should use arguments to go to the definition, but the definition can't be used uh, in arguments. How do you mean, sorry? Uh, the definition of the property can't be used as an argument because it is the result to which we are going. Because as right, long as you are yeah. using that uh, you can only uh, own physical objects, I can say no, you can own physical and non-physical objects. So we can't use this definition in any way as an argument, not you and not me. We, we can't use this as arguments because we should bring arguments and come to the end. Yeah, OK, OK, yeah. I mean, I, I understand what you're saying. I mean, that does allude a little bit to why I think that we need to have like to draw a line and have some kind of consensus over what reality is and what the non-aggression principle is and what property is like we do need to have that because otherwise it opens the door for these kind of conflicts where a commie would say I don't recognize your right to own the means of production and 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 somebody else would say well I don't recognize your right to take my idea you know and stuff like that and or or because I you know because I view it as my property and, and what have you so that kind of alludes to a little bit my argument as to why I think we need to have a line in the sand and 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 say okay well okay there's reasonable differences and in, in what of interpretation but there's also you know like a, a line we've got to draw to have some kind of universal coherent definition so um so yeah i i i do understand what you're saying i mean the thing is is like the, the the one point I will will kind of hold on to a little bit though is this tangible property idea because whether or not because 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 the idea is is if it's your prop like if there's an actual 
like like it's 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 physically here like you know that, that and we say okay well that's your property if you know, it's depending on my accepting that that is your property but if i accept that's your property then it doesn't matter whether i well it does matter through a severity point of view but i don't have right to it whatever it is even if i do something that doesn't harm it the fact is i don't have right to that so that so the, that, that's the only point I was making with regards. I know what you were saying about like, oh, well, you still got your book. Well, you still got your property if I step on it. But the fact of the matter is, is I don't have a right to it because it is your physical property. Your idea is not your physical property. So that's why I feel like I have a, a right to it, because it's it's just an idea out in the ether. It's not like a, it's not something that you can um, um, because because it's not a scarce resource. You can't have that. Um, I'm not scared. I, I'm, I'm struggling to find the right way to explain this. Um, but I know that, <laughs> or I still feel like I'm right, but I'm struggling to um, really articulate why. <laughs> um, I also think you are right. But... Yeah, no, and, no, and I, yeah, I, I understand that you're playing devil's advocate and, and showing the, the argument rather than saying that I you agree to, with the argument. I wanted to show you that, uh, that this is the problem with the, yeah. with the drawing the lines. You said, uh, at the problem is it is these two points. At first, you say black and white, the uh, intellectual property is total desert. Mm. On the other hand, you are saying uh, beyond no reason, beyond any reasonable doubt. But I think that our discussion here is quite clearly showing that it's no beyond no reasonable doubt, because even that we were discussing about it for I don't know 15 minutes. And after that 15 minutes, you feel you are right, but you can't put it into word. And I know it's very, it's very uh, like hard and and very difficult. I think that this is quite, uh, this is quite proof that it's not beyond any reasonable doubt. Because if it would be, I don't think that we could get into this situation. Because I think that the doubts are reasonable. Just, I think that just because you even if we both are agreeing with uh, that intellectual property is not a property and we can have here discussion and in the discussion uh, the one who is defending intellectual as a property uh, is not like absolutely lost the debate it's just like all the time running and running and we we are argumenting and counter argumenting i don't think we can say this is beyond all reasonable doubt and uh, I, I uh, feel this as a as a, a bit uh, ambig ambiguous in, in meaning like on the other hand pure desert and on the other and, and no reasonable doubt and on the other hand uh, this so I I am not telling you that you should or shouldn't draw lines I'm not coming with some conclusion I'm just pointing on that it's very hard to draw the lines and that draw a line, for example, that intellectual property is definitely not, not non-aggression principle. I would be very careful with it because I I agree with you. Abs yeah, I absolutely yeah. agree with you that intellectual property is not a property, but I wouldn't say like it's pure desert. I would see it uh, as something between grass and desert in between on who in between uh, i mean depending on who is judging it and what arguments the person brings to the debate yeah i mean i yeah i i mean you make you i mean you make some good argument i mean the thing is is i i feel like it's a failure of my articulation rather than a failure of the argument and it's something i'm going to try and think about more and, and really kind of polish my kind of um you know the way I kind of present my argument on that um which is why I appreciate conversations like this because it obviously helps you know refine my understanding like of the ideas um but I suppose like the way because the, the thing is is like every individual point you can give me a counter like I say oh I can copy your book um and you've still got your book and you're like well I can trespass on your yard and you've still got your yard and 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 that counters that one little thing but my point is is I can say well like, yeah but I can establish why my property is my property and why like I should have right like you know why I have right over it and why you would be aggressing against me if you were to say steal it from me and what have you and though you can point to examples of ways in which you could kind of 
um, use my property, which we can establish is my property without doing other things that are that I'm using as arguments against the intellectual property. My problem is, is I can't see any tangible basis for the argument of aggression with regards to taking so-called intellectual property. I can see good counters for some of the other sides arguments like what you, and you've given great a lot of great count encounters that have really kind of made me have to think um but the, the the reality still comes that when i'm if i try to put myself on the other side of the argument and argue for intellectual property it's hard for me to make a case of aggression in any case or, 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 or ownership because it's like well what have i got ownership over like i can't i you know like i, I can say that i've got ownership I can point to tangible property and say that's mine and you don't have right to it. So even if you trespass on it in a way that still leaves me with it, just like you can take my book and still leave me with it. All right, those things are an equivalent, but the overall um, comparison between intellectual property and tangible property isn't an equivalent in all and in, in in all directions, if you know what I mean, because there there there's still there's still a distinction to be made. There's still the fact that. If I was to take that property from you, not just trespass it, not just use it without hurting you, but actually take it, you would be without it. Like we have, we do have something that we can use to actually establish and call it property that that wouldn't that wouldn't apply to like an idea or something like that. But I, I do take your point though, because and it's a very good point as well about the problem is is like you know if if if. It doesn't. It doesn't necessarily mean that I have to accept that it's your property for, um, you know, for that. Because because what if a commie just says, well, I don't, I don't accept. Just like I don't accept the, you know, like the thingy. I don't accept that you own your factory or your house, and I'm going to take it from you or whatever. But this is actually kind of, in my mind at least, this this actually alludes to because I, I do understand the point you're making about the problem with drawing lines, and it is difficult. And this is why I think it should be reserved for what we're calling the black and white. I I agree there's no absolute certainty. I still think we can get what we would call a reasonable certainty because we can lower the bar a little bit to take it from absolute to reasonable. Um, but but my point is is I actually think that what this as well as um revealing my own flaws in articulating my argument against intellectual property i think this also does reveal though the danger in not drawing the lines with regards to saying what is okay this is property and this isn't because if we don't do that like i'm saying we need to do with intellectual property like i'm saying we need to do with saying children aren't property and all these other little things that libertarians are disagreeing with the reason why i'm not happy to just say OK, well, let's just agree to disagree. I'm saying, well, no, if there is a right answer here that we can like objectively identify according to the principle, then we need to find it because we do need to draw a line. Because if we don't draw a line, just like we're not going to do with intellectual property, then the same danger occurs with things like the commies not rep recognising your right. Yes. And, and this is why, in a practical sense, I feel like we need to draw these lines, because otherwise, if we don't have some kind of consensus on reality, some kind of consensus on property, aggression and what have you, then people are just going to be in conflict with each other because the commie won't recognise your right to own the factory. You will recognise it and you'll fight each other over it. But um, you can say, OK, well, the same thing could happen over the person who's trying to take my book. But the difference is, is you've actually got a tangible argument for why your your property is your property why they can't if they took it from you you wouldn't have it anymore and while okay trespassing it doesn't cause you any lasting harm of taking it from you it's still your property that they don't have a right to that you know that, that they're using without you using whereas because an idea isn't like tangible property i just you know like like you've, you've you've got that kind of thing well where's the aggression that you're pointing to when i when i you know copy your idea or whatever you know you, you put it out there into the ether if it's like you know i the, i feel like this kind of reveals why we need to draw the lines because like we need like to have if 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 it's possible 
to for, for humanity to unite at all like if that's even possible you know even theoretically forget about all the practical problems but even theoretically then the only way it's possible is if we all accept the right over that we have right over ourselves like that that self-ownership and go from there and that gives us that right to own property because of how we create it and and because it's because it's a tan because because like i say if you could copy my property then i don't have a problem if you can copy my house which is more of an equivalent to copying my book you know like i you know if i wrote a book you can't take that book you can take my idea because it's not a a tangible thing I, like i say my, my failings to articulate this argument notwithstanding i still think we can say on a reasonable certainty but we would not need to presuppose a definition of property a definition of the non-aggression principle and a kind of definition of basic reality so i do see that it's not completely without problems okay. but i i think that it's, it's kind of like the it's like when i said we can't escape subjectivity 100 mm. percent. we can minimize it to that like you know to what's like when we talk about humanly possible when we talk about reasonable certainty these are all acknowledgements of the fact that we can't achieve absolute perfection but we can we can we can kind of draw reasonable lines of like that are consistent with the principle and you know like i say if we're having a distinction between a desert and a grass now we can say this is definitely the desert because we've already defined what a desert is and how it's different from the grass then so we can use that definition to draw a line that is as objective as possible and we can do the same with property sorry go on look uh, with the with the intellectual property uh i got some uh, discussions with uh, Czech libertarians who are, some of them are uh, defenders of intellectual property. So I read a lot of, lot of it, a lot of arguments uh, for and against. And uh, I don't think that uh, your problem is just that uh, you can't formulate the argument, but I think that um, there is no ethical essential princip principle argument uh, for uh, that intellectual property is not a property. I I must say I hate uh, utilitarian arguments, utility arguments, I don't know, uh, this this kind of arguments. I, I really like the essential uh, ethical arguments, not the utility ones. On the other hand, for the intellectual property, I find something between. I wouldn't say that I have just utilitarian argument. I can't, but I also can't say I have purely ethical argument. I think that the most ethical argument is still in this semi-utilitarian. And it is that in the case of uh, physical property, you can quite always know if, when you uh, when you break it or, or not. In the case of intellectual property, you basically never know. So this is my like final argument for uh, for physical property that in case of physical property, it's not always clear when you are uh, when you are breaking it and when not. But in most cases, it is, in most cases it is. And moreover, you can act in a way that you can be quite very sure that you are not uh, you are not breaking any physical property like not 100 percent sure but you can adjust your activity. reasonable certainty that you are yeah, yeah that, that you are you can be very sure that you are not breaking if we would uh, if we would uh, use the intellectual property as a property you can be literally never sure that you are not breaking somebody's property and uh, this is something with, uh, which I don't see as pure ethical argument because it's semi-utilitarian argument. It's kind of it's practical, yeah. Utilitarian, like uh, people will be more wealthy, more, more something, not like this, like more happy and so on. It's just argument that if you apply intellectual property as property, uh, it's quite not possible for anybody to know in almost any case that they are not breaking somebody's property. So this is my 
like top argument, but I am still not so much satisfied with it because this argument is still not purely ethics and you can't, I, I am very much sure that you can't derive this from the self-ownership. Like from the self-ownership, you can derive the uh, normal property. You, I, I believe that you can from self-ownership also derive the intellectual property, but the distinction between these two concepts is semi-utilitarian in this meaning that in one case you can quite always know that you are not breaking property and the other case you can't. So I am tending to choose the one when people know their rights quite all the time. But I don't uh, think that there is some pure logical line from self-ownership to physical property which is absolutely logically excluding the intellectual property. I don't think there is something like that. I think that you can derive the intellectual property from uh, from self-ownership as well as you can derive the physical property. I think you can in the sense of like, you know, like if I come up with an idea, I can say, well, that's my idea, but I don't have a right ex to exclude other people from the idea because it's not a physical thing like um yes but this is uh, this is still uh, this is still circular argumentation like you can't exclude because it's not physical thing it's I, I can say i can't exclude because it is physical thing it's it's like you know this is not like you can use force to ensure something and there are situations when you can use force to protect your physical property but you can also use force to uh, protect your intellectual property. And in, in both cases, you can be successful and not. And we are again going to the utilitarian ground that in the case of physical property, you can much better keep it and guard it and you can be much more successful in. <clears throat> yeah, I suppose, I suppose but the arguments for aggression in the case of um, taking you know like with regards to your physical property and your right to it and and that coming from self-ownership like i can i can understand what you're saying like there are certainly some of those arguments that could be applied to intellectual property like your creation of it for example but there are also things like its tangible physical existence that you can't apply to an idea that you can apply to physical property you know like like um you know, like, like, it, like I say, it does come a little bit into how, you know, like our definition of property, but there is, there are, there are distinctions that we can make that are, I don't know if I would call them objective, but. But sorry. you can make the distinction even in, uh, within the physical property. You can, for example, say uh, that it's different to, uh, it's different, there is definitely you can make distinction between own something which is movable and which is not movable or between owning a land. You can, there is definitely very big distinction between owning a pencil or, or a book or notebook and owning a land because the land, you are not owning the, uh, the dirt, you are owning the space. So you can, you can definitely own a space. By the way, it's not some absolute space, it's some space related to the center of the earth or whatever. So you can own a space and you are right that you can make a distinction between intellectual property and physical property. Definitely, yes, I'm not saying that you can't, but as well, you can do a distinction between owning of physical objects as and owning of space. And uh, I would, oh, I, I mean, I, I might have a slightly different conceptualization of land ownership to you, but the way I view things like land and space occupancy is it's not about owning the space or the land. It's about owning yourself or your rightfully owned property like your house and, and whatever else that's just occupying and using, to use commie language, um, is just occupying and using that space. Like the example I use is like imagine we're just in 
some area that's just unknown, like we're in the middle of a forest or wherever, it doesn't matter. We both agree that we both own ourselves, but the forest is neither of our property. So we both have equal right to stand in a spot. So now you're standing over there, say you have a little picnic with your family, and I want to stand in that spot because we have equal right to it, but you were there first. And because we both have equal right, the person who was there first, who's now occupying and using it with their rightfully owned property, which is themselves and whatever else they've got going on with their picnic, and it would be aggressive for me to you know take you off that and, and and what have you but in my mind you don't own that land you don't own that space i mean you kind of do but it's only as an extension of your ownership over yourself and your rightfully owned property and i basically apply the same That's ethos true. with yeah. but you can say the same uh, and you are absolutely right i agree but my point is that you can say the same about your intellectual property how and so? this was my point for all the time you can say the same that the intellectual property is extension of my uh, my uh, self ownership you, you can say the, the same thing about it that uh, as well as you are uh, you, you are using uh, space then uh, you can use a poem Yeah, but the, the the thing is, is like space again. I, I, I know scarce resource isn't the like you know. Yes, one is like scarce, the... one is not. So I mm. also agree that the space is scarce resource and the poem is not. But the point is that you are owning it even if there is no uh, scarcity problem. So uh, if if you would be some communist who would say that you are owning it just and only when there is the the scarcity conflict, like. As long as you are standing there, it's yours. But when you move somewhere else, it's not yours anymore. Then you would be right. But you are also saying that you are you are still owner of it if there is not the problem of scarcity. So uh, this is well, it, well. I mean, just to clarify what I mean by scarcity, I mean by the fact that like like with something being a physical object, it doesn't have to be like scarce as in there's not much of it in that sense. But like 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 if I own. If I own like a car, like those particular, like it's all a physical object, like, like I, you know, like, like my idea, I can have that completely. I don't have to shit, like I don't, it's not a physical thing that I have to give you some of and then I've got less of it and what have you. It's like a, it's, it's almost like a, it's almost like a different realm. It's almost like you've got the physical world and then you've got the abstract and your ideas exist in the abstract. And I suppose I'm saying um, that that's not something that I recognize as property because property relates to the physical world. And I can just ideas say of, yeah. that not. The, the, the point is that I can just, like you say, the property only exists in physical world and I can say no. <laughs> and because this is <laughs> not, not an argument, this is the definition. But uh, I would like to, if you wouldn't mind, I would like to try another, another uh, such a debate. And it's uh, maybe we would have the same opinion to it, maybe not, uh, because it's when we were talking about uh, deriving things from the self ownership. I believe that a person can sell sell himself to the slavery, that you can uh, that you can release the ownership of your own body. So you can, I think that you can give up of your self ownership, and uh, in. I know that in the Czech community of libertarians, this is the I, I'm in the majority of people who think this, but in the world community, I think that the majority is saying that you can't sell yourself to uh, slavery. What do you think about this? Um, I think you cannot sell yourself into slavery, but I want to elaborate on what I mean by that, because it's it's a it's kind of a complicated thing, because the reason why I say you can't sell yourself into say, slavery it's like you you can make that contract you own yourself and you can make whatever contract and commitment that you like but the problem is is it's like saying i will um transport you to saturn or something it's like it's it's physically impossible or it's like it's, it's impossible for me to actually i mean it's a little bit how i'm defining slavery and and like saying like okay now because because the problem is is slavery is basically saying okay well i'm your property and i no longer own myself now i own you and the idea is is well if we own ourselves we can sell ourselves so that somebody else now owns us and if we own ourselves like i've got the right to sell my car to you so why don't i have the right to sell my self to you the problem is is it's not so much about the right because I, I can i can make a contractual promise to you 
to be your quote unquote slave. But that's not really being your slave. That's me making a promise to exercise my self ownership in a way that's acting like a slave. But if I decided to violate that contract, for example, you could say, oh, I mean, I'm I'm in violation of my contract and you could accuse me of of even that violations involved with that. Like if I've defrauded you out of money, like, say, you know, I've agreed to do it for a price and now I'm not fulfilling my end of the bargain and all the rest of it. But even if we accept that I've infringed upon you by breaking my contract, can we say that a reasonable and proportionate punishment for that would be to enslave me for the rest of my life? Like, you know, like, because obviously there's still proportionality and necess necessity that comes into play when it comes to justifiable enforcement of the non-aggression principle. So it's, I, I, I don't want to sound like I'm playing word games because it does, it does fall within my, how I'm defining a slave and what a slave truly is, because it's like, you know, like a lot of, because I've heard a lot of arguments for voluntary slavery, like, for example, Walter Block is quite well known oh. outside of the Czech for being someone who says you can sell yourself to, oh. as, as a slave. And then someone like Stefan Kinsella, I don't know if you know him, but he's a good example who someone who makes the opposite argument saying, yes. no, you can't. And I fall more on Stefan Kinsella's side of it because I and it partly comes down to how I define what a slave actually is. And it's like by promising to give myself over to you completely, I'm kind of making a promise that I can't really 100 percent. I can't really give make myself your slave. I can promise to act as your slave. You know, I can promise to fulfill all the particulars of the contract that we're calling slavery, but it's not really slavery. It's really just a contract. It's really just an employment contract that I could break at any time because the fact of the matter is, is the the the, the self autonomy is all like it's kind of like I'm not I mean I'm, I'm not particularly religious, but it's kind of like saying I'm going to give my free will to you. You can't do that. You can just promise to dedicate your free will to me and act as if my free will belongs to you and I no longer have it. But you it's always yours underneath and you could violate that contract. And even if you're wrong to do so and be violating your rights, I don't think they could hold you to it because it wouldn't be a proportionate and um, punishment. Sorry. The slave can, of course, try to escape or whatever. But he's slave and he's the uh, the property of the other. And I think that uh, well, my main argument for how why you can put yourself into slavery voluntarily is that I suppose that we both would agree that you can sell any of your organs to anybody. Yeah. So as you can sell your organs to anybody, uh, you can also loan anything to anybody to borrow something. So, if you sell me your organs, which you need for a living, and I will borrow it to you, and you can use it, as long as I say you can use it, then this is practical slavery, because as long as you would do what I want, I am borrowing your organs. And since the moment you don't, I am taking my organs back. And I think this is the practical slavery uh, done by contract, not for slavery contract, because there is this uh, this problem you, you just you just meant. And I know this uh, I know this argument, and is the is the Kinsas argument, and also I think Hope's argument. And but I think that this can be bypassed by saying, okay, one person sell its organs to the other person, and the other person borrows that organs to the first person. And the uh, condition of this loan is that the first person have to do everything what the other person says, and when not, it dies. So I think that you can uh, you can do absolutely equivalent state to slavery by uh, selling and uh, borrowing organs. Yeah, I, I understand that argument, um, and that's a good point. But the, the, I think, and, and this unfortunately does come back to our definitions again, but your organs are not you i mean just like you i mean they're pretty vital <laughs> i understand yes um, but the, the the thing is is like you could cut your hair and sell it as a wig and that's no longer your property it will be somebody else's property like they now own that your hair as a wig so and like i can sell my labor and all the rest of it the problem is is it's like i mean it, it comes down to and this is 
a difficult question because there's not really a definitive answer to this question, but it does come down to what, when we talk about self-ownership, it was like, okay, well, what is the self? You know, who are you? What part of you do we remove that it's actually you? You know, I mean, and this is... I think there is no such a part. Well, per perhaps not, but we are kind of working on the premise of that because we're saying, you know, we are working on the... We, we are working on certain presuppositions of reality. And one of those presuppositions is that we are individual selves. There is such a person as you. There is a self there. And the, 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 the floor I see in your, I mean, it's a good argument, but the, the floor I see in that argument is it's presupposing that every part of your body is part of yourself, even after you've separated it from you. You know, like, you know, like, like what I'm saying is, is like, if I cut my hair and discard it, it's no longer part. It's not me. You know, it's like, and you're, and that I is, don't although, I, go on. I don't think I assume this because, uh, the, like, of course you can define slavery in a way that nobody ever was anybody's slave. Like if you, uh, if you define slavery by some quite, uh, I don't know, weird way, like that you are a slave only in the in the circumstance that somebody own your self whatever the self is then you can even come to that there was no slavery ever in the world because no slave was putting his self to somebody but if we are seeing slavery as what it really was in history i mean somebody is owning the other people giving them orders and if they don't uh, fulfill their orders he kills them or he can kill them just like that uh the, in this there is no, nobody is asking uh who is owning the self of the person and in this i i find the arguments of the of, of those people who are, who are saying that you can't sell yourself to the slavery as quite uh inconsistent because i suppose that if you would ask uh, kinsella i think that kinsella would say that you can't sell your your to yourself to slavery because you can't sell the self but if you would ask Kinsella was there slavery in the United States uh, 200 years ago he would say yes uh, and I think this is uh, mm, this is one against each other like if you really can't uh, sell the self then there was no no real slavery ever but if we okay yeah I see the slavery what was really here like in ancient Rome, like in in everywhere, basically a few hundred years ago, then I think you can sell uh, yourself to slavery according to now. Okay, yeah, okay, I understand what you're saying. I mean, I, I've had a similar point put to me before about whether are slaves really slaves, because it's like, well, basically the argument you made. That, but my counter to that would be is, a, a slave, because the, the, the problem is, is the slavery that was practiced throughout history was built on a certain presupposition that is almost completely contrary to the presupposition of individual self-ownership. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's almost antithetical to it. It's like, you know, the idea of self-ownership is that we're, we're not property. We're individuals who have right over ourselves. Slavery goes against that and deems people as property that can be owned. So what I'm, what I'm saying is, is the reason why. So 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 when you say, OK, well, the, were they re, were they slaves then? Because we're saying that that's not even a legitimate you know, title for what they were. They were just being treated as slaves. And in a set in a certain sense, that's true. I mean, I had it once. Um, somebody asked me if a slave had the right of self ownership. And, and, and at first I wasn't sure what they were asking me because they were obviously were having that right denied, but it was rightfully their right, if you know what I'm saying. Like yeah, it's a little well, bit like, you know, it's a little bit like a woman has a right or a man or anyone has a right not to be raped. But if they're being raped, that right doesn't do them much good because that right's being cool. violated. Yeah. So my point. So when he says to me, are were slaves really slaves? I was like, well from a philosophical point of view they were free individuals that were treated as slaves so the, so when i say that there's no such 
so so my, that would be my counter to your point about oh well then there's no such thing as slavery if you're saying that because i'm saying well no in a sense there isn't any such thing as a slave because it's a totally okay. illeg it's an illegitimate designation and conceptualization or whatever so we're saying what happened is is pe people can be you know like like the people that were treated as slaves they they weren't actually they were slaves in one sense but you, do you know what i'm saying like they were treated that way but in a true moral sense of for at least for people that believe in self ownership, they were that was wrong. You know, they weren't slaves. They were just treated as slaves. They were treated as property when they were actually self owning individuals that were that were on a moral point of view free, but in a practical sense they were denied that freedom of by course. people. Yeah, uh, and uh, of course that, that, that's true. But uh, that if I say uh, if we would consider the slaves in slavery as slave. Like if we would call them slaves, then do you think you can uh, you can uh, according to uh, principle non aggression principle sell yourself to slavery if we would call that what was here a slave? Well, well, well no, because like if we if we're going to say that they were slaves, we'd have to acknowledge like like we we're saying we're not saying it in the context that we really think that they're actually slaves in this moral philosophical sense we're saying that they're slaves as in that's how they're being treated you know like as slaves like as property who don't own themselves what i'm saying is is a self-owning person can't sell themselves in that sense because they will they will always be a free individual and although they can be treated like a slave that's still dependent on their volunteering to do so like like what i'm saying is is like you know like you could my argument about like someone not truly being a slave you could say well that means that no one was ever a slave but they were treated like slaves so what i'm saying is is so like you can oh, you can volunteer to be treated like a slave but that's not the same as someone forcing you to be a slave like you know like designating you a slave you know because if you're volunteering to be a slave that's more like employment that's like i volunteer to use my like, what i'm saying is is one recognizes your right as a self-owning individual to commit to contracts and the other considers you to be property who doesn't have right over themselves who other people can buy and sell like they would a chair or, or a car or or whatever else so that's kind of like but my, as said, they still well, have the rights so they, they, are, they are just suppressed yeah i guess so yeah but what i'm saying is is if so yeah i mean it's like it's, it's a bit of a failing in our language and i don't mean different languages i mean in human language i, I know what it is Yes. You know what I mean? But like, you know, because it's it's like because that's the problem I have with this other guy when he said, well, worse, did slaves have self-ownership? I was like, well, no, they well, they yes, but no. But well, they did in a moral sense, but they didn't in a it was denied to them sense. And that's what I mean about like the slaves in the so past. Even by uh, non-aggression principle, you can get yourself to this uh, to this uh, state. To the same equal state that you are treated as a slave and it's legitimate. <laughs> Well, no, because it's no, because what they've, they've, they're, they're both that you, you could get yourself into a situation that has all the trap that seems to be on the surface the same, but you're coming from a completely different premise, you know, like, yes, like but I, yeah, yes, but uh, the, the question is if it's legitimate to make a contract that you are treated as a slave, but hold the thing is not violating non aggression principle. Do you think this is possible or not? Depends on how you say treated like a slave, because classes, the same, the history. Well, 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 the, well, the thing is, you could have a lot of the trappings of slavery, like, uh, like on a surface level, you could be, but there's there there will be underpinning things that would be different, you know, like 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 the underpinning difference between employment and slavery, you know, like you know, like there are there are you know, what I'm saying is is like in in actual slavery your self ownership is just not it's not there as a presupposition it's not there as a premise you didn't sell yourself into slavery someone saw you as property who has no right over themselves declared you a property made you know made you a slave and all the rest of it if you volunteer to be a slave and in, in quotations 
what I'm saying is, is you, you're you're volunteering to. It's a little bit like you know, so, someone says, "Oh, I'll be your sex slave" or whatever. You're not really a slave because it's a voluntary thing. And like, I suppose my point is, is part of the definition of slavery is its ah. involuntary nature. Okay, and okay. That's, so if you okay, if you define slave, that it's involuntary. That's obvious. That you can. Voluntary. So, yeah, yes, I see. That's how kind of circular, this is yeah. quite <laughs> definition trick, I think, because if you just follow the what's really happening there and not how it's defined, I think it's possible that the impossibility is just uh, made by. Uh, but the difference is, well, let's go back to the sex slave thing, because if you were an actual sex slave, as in a real slave that was being forced to be that way and treated as property, but used as a, as a sex toy, let's say, for example, or if you were one of these kind of you know kinky people that wants to be a sex slave, what the difference is, is one is still recognised underneath this veneer of pretending to be a slave and acting as a slave and promising to play that character and role underneath that is a recognition of that person's self-ownership as an individual, not property. Whereas the other scenario of actual slavery and the sex slave is underneath that is no recognition of them actually being the true owners of themselves and volunteering their property. It doesn't matter about their consent. You know, so so what I'm saying, and because of that, and, and, and that underneath isn't irrelevant to the, what's happening on top, because the, the person who's viewed as property and has no ownership over themselves, there's not going to be any recognition of their right to change their mind or anything like that. Whereas the person who has that self-ownership, who did sell themselves into it, the same self-ownership that gave them the right to make these contractual promises that very much look like slavery on the surface, they don't have that foundation of slavery where that person is a, uh, is, is, a is a bit of property because underneath it, is that self-ownership that person isn't i mean what i'm saying is is one started with the idea that you're not a piece of property you're a self-owning individual yes and the yes. other one started with the idea that you're a bit of property yes. so of you can get out of one because you can invoke the premise that allow, like what i'm saying is if someone says if someone if you say say you volunteered yourself for slavery and then you changed your mind and someone says well you can't change your mind you're a slave it's like well actually i'm a self-owning individual and the same self-owning right that i had but to this make this contract true, uh, this is not true in the case with the selling the organs, because then you can't change the mind. Yeah, but that's because you separate. It from no, no, you didn't separate them. You, two. you transfer the ownership of the organs, but you didn't separate the organs. The, the, the point is that uh, you. Oh, well, they're still in your body. You mean? Yeah. No. No. Not whole. Yes, you can hold body, but even organs, it doesn't matter. The the point is that uh, if one person sells. For example, it's heart or brain or whatever. But it's not separated from the body. It's just sold. You, you don't have to do okay, the physical okay. transfer to do the ownership transfer. I, so, I'm just saying it's yours, like yeah. Yeah. So so now uh, one person owns the heart of other person, but the heart is still within the body. And let's say it it he he owns even the body around the heart, just just the chest. Let's say you sell your chest. And in this case, it's still part of your body, but the owner is somebody else. And in this case, you can't change your mind because you already sold. And uh, if and, and by by this way, he can always by I think legitimate mean tells you you do what you what I want or you die. Uh, because you already sold the body, the body is there, the body is there, it, it wasn't physical transferred, but because the owner, the owner can decide if the body will st stay there or if the heart will be uh, separated from the body. So I think that uh, this way is exactly the way how you can't, uh, how you, even if the person would change his mind, it won't help because he already sold the body. So I think this this will practically make him uh, a slave. I mean, treat it as a slave, but without the chance to change the mind. Right. Yeah, I understand what you're saying now. Sorry, I, when you said about selling the organs, I thought about like you know, like when you actually take I'm it sorry, out of your body I, I and I give it to something like yes. a transplant. And so yeah, okay, I, I understand what you're saying now, and I I, I see the. I see the argument now because obviously 
like you're saying, if you, if I can say that, okay, my liver's now yours, and now my heart's yours, why can't I just do that with every single part of my yes, body? Because yes, there's yes. no yes. right. Okay, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, no, that's 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 a fair point actually. Um, I had I honestly hadn't really thought about it in that sense. Um, I suppose. I mean. It, it's funny because I feel like we're deeping into such deep philosophical waters. It's we're getting to the point of what is the self? You know, like we were saying, can you sell yourself? Well, to to answer that question, you've got to really say, well, what is yourself? It's not it's not your finger, it's not your hair, it's not your organ, it's it's something else. And the problem with answering that question is obviously this is a work around that you don't need to. This argument is work work around of this because you. You don't need to know what is self because nobody you you don't mostly when there is the argumentation about the slavery and even if i see the blog who is uh, having the same uh, same opinion as me and the kinsella who has the same opinion as you uh, they also are uh, debating there about the what is self and what you can and what you can't do and so on also hope about uh, i think that this argument with the organs is work around to it because uh, you don't need to know what is self. You just can sell the body and that's all because you sell the physical body and then the physical body is property of somebody else and you definitely can sell physical body because if you can sell single organs, then you can definitely sell whole your body. And as you sold, uh, there is at first doesn't matter who is self, uh, and then, according to non-aggression principle, the body has another owner, so the owner can legitimately kill you anytime. And uh, this is making you somebody who can be treated like a slave, uh, but the non-aggression principle is not violated. Yeah. Um... Yes, that's, that's that's quite a that's that's the more compelling argument than I come across actually because I, I dig I see where you're getting at actually and um, the because the, I've had discussions like this with people like Walter Block um, and it was never really presented like that it was always kind of more presented on the side of like well you know you've made a contract so you, that's it it's it's done you've transferred your ownership and obviously our our side of the argument like both mine and Stefan Kinsella's from what I understand it has always been well you can't really ever sell sure. yourself because you can't yes. because who you are is you can never really exactly. give that away um and even though I still kind of hold on to that as a true statement what you're saying about though is okay but you can sell your liver you can sell your heart you can sell this that and the other and it's hard to draw a line and say okay well yeah but now you're selling yourself and you're not able to do that you can even sell your heart when you die by that you you can decide to sell your heart and die uh or give your heart and die it's definitely every libertarian say yes to that but then you can also send, sell your heart and not die now, but die in the moment when somebody else chooses. And if you can do this, I think uh, in, in this case, you are practically a slave in, and it's not violation of non-aggression principle. Because you are, of course, the slave in the meaning of, in the, in the meaning of the, the slaves in the past were also slaves in the meaning of do what your master tells you or you die. Uh, and this is the this practical meaning of slavery. I also agree that they were still uh, self owners, but uh, this right was suppressed. Yeah, yeah. So I, I wanted just to say this that uh, I, I put this uh, argument because at first, always when I uh, read Hoppe or or Block and Kinsella and this argumentation, I uh, this was the first thing that came to my mind, and I was like, you don't need to even agree on what yeah. is self because it's it can be done another way. Uh, but the point why I was telling it now is uh, the non-aggression principle. I think is the best, uh, the best, uh, let's say, the best law it's not a law it's the best principle it's the best yeah. ethics tool we have here i absolutely didn't find any better so i absolutely agree with you that it's great but 
On the other hand, I think that every law, every ethical principle like this, uh, can't be self-explanatory, and you can't have you can't have algorithmic solution of that of, of that. Like every law has to have some judges or arbiters or or something like that, because no law is self-explanatory, and. Uh, I see the, the when you try to draw the line, I think you are trying to make the NAP self-explanatory, which would be absolutely great if the NAP would be self-explanatory. I would love it. But I think that the world is too complex to make any self-explanatory right, except of such like uh, you can do whatever you want as long as you are stronger. This is self-explanatory, right? Because it's always, but if we want to have any law, even if we, if we want to have a non-aggression principle or law of any existing state or any historical law or whatever, I think you it's never self-explanatory and you always have to have some judge, uh, somebody who will always somehow apply it to some uh, some cases. And uh, <clears throat> I, I on purpose uh, ask you on this because I somehow guess that we will not agree on it. And there's few other topics like that, which probably some anarcho-capitalists wouldn't agree, which is still very much great because we went much more far than most of other people who are not voluntarists or anarcho-capitalists because I like to talk to anarcho-communists. I know some of them and their opinions are so much different different one from each other uh, that is absolutely not consistent together. I love that anarcho-capitalists are very consistent together, but even we have some some points where we quite can't agree. And if somebody would come with self-explanatory nap who wouldn't need any judge or arbiter or, or any such a person, I would love it and it would be great, but I don't think it's possible. OK, well, I'm not going to give up that mission quite yet, but um, but no, you've definitely given me a lot of food for thought. I mean, like the slavery thing, definitely um, I'm going to sort of continue to mull that one over, particularly the points you made with regards to the raise, uh, the selling of the organs. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm still kind of niggled by some counter arguments with regards, well, not counter specifically to that, but counter arguments in the overall um, voluntary slavery thing with regards to the because there's still a contradiction with regards to the underlying premise of like you know slavery where people are viewed as property and bought and sold against their will and then this voluntary slavery so there is obviously but that's a definitional thing on, on what we're calling a slave and obviously there's obviously the whole thing about being treated as a slave and actually being it in a as, a, as part of a moral reality as well so um, but no, you, that's, a, that's a very good point about the organs thing. Um, I would like to ask you if you would, yeah. I, I noticed that you are talking to famous anarcho-capitalists from the world. If you would, uh, if you would meet some of them, I would like if you can present them this, uh, this argument and yeah. if, if yes, then write it to me and I would like to uh, watch a video and where, where you are talking about this because I am, I'm very much active on the Czech libertarian uh, on the Czech libertarian scene. I wrote a book. I am I, I wrote more than one thousand of texts, uh, short text, but anyway. But I am writing everything in my language because I don't feel so comfortable in English. I'm reading it. Uh, I'm re reading it, but I'm not. Uh, I'm not active in this uh, in this talkings or discussions. So if you would uh, put this argument to some worldwide discussion, I would be happy. And if you would send me the link to it, I would be very happy to hear somebody to talk about this because maybe those people will come with something which is a good counter argument to this and which I, I didn't, didn't sort out. Yeah, for sure I will. And I mean, to be honest, although I will do that, I do think you should talk to some of these people directly as well. I mean, I don't, I, I've had a perfectly good conversation with you. I haven't had any problems with regards to language and that. So um, I, I would encourage you to speak to these people directly, but I'll gladly also present those arguments as well. Um, I mean, I, like I say, I, there's, there's still certain things that even I can kind of see that I can imagine them saying with regards to, like I say, there's the, like I say, the coherence of the premise of, you know, a 
declassing people as property at the beginning and classing them as self-owning individuals and the kind of you know the idea of saying well you know um so I, you know there is still that and, and there is still the can you really sell your self but like i say i do take your point about the whole well if we're going to let you sell first we'll let you cut you you know and you can you can you almost do it in stages you say well can i sell my hair and you go okay yeah okay well can i sell my organ it's like okay yeah can i sell it and keep it in my body though uh, yeah, and and then you know, and you just build it up and build it up to the point that there's nothing physical left that we can point to that you haven't sold to somebody else. But you still, don't yourself. Sell you don't even need to sell hold the body for it. You can just sell the part which is uh, which you need for my arms and legs or whatever. Yeah. No, uh, I mean something which you need for your life. Uh, if you sell something what you need for your life, it's make you practical slave. Yeah. legs are still making you a choice to be quadriplegic or slave but selling your chest is just giving you the uh, the possibility to be a slave or to be dead uh, which is quite equal to slavery um oh, hello, you there? oh yeah um yeah 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 it's i mean i'm, I'm gonna it's, honest, it's not I, I think it's something i want to go away and think about more and then I don't know if you'd be up for another conversation sometime. Not okay, just, I would just be happy. About I don't know about. I don't know how you feel about this, but I personally like to have more than one conversation with the same person because okay. I always feel like we can get deeper because you can build on the previous conversation. You know, whereas if you have like multiple conversations with different people all the time, you're always starting at the beginning and mm -hmm. you don't get to go deeper. Yes. So. If, I would be glad to. I would be glad to do that because, to be honest, the reason why I'm not uh, putting myself into this uh, worldwide uh, conversations is that it's very, it's very exhausting for me, and I don't feel comfor comfortable like that because when I'm having the Czech discussion, I can absolutely talk for three or four hours, and I'm absolutely not tired, and it's just it's just joy. This is a lot of joy, but also. Uh, a lot of uh, I'm tired now, and I, I I I'm really like oh my god. So if we will if we will repeat it, I will get used to this. And I also I also see during the time that as I'm as I'm talking to to people or when I have to have some lesson lesson in English, uh, it's always better and better. So I would be glad to do it even for maybe it will move me somewhere towards to make even English debates. Yeah, OK, well, I mean, helping your English and from my point of view, helping our understanding of the ideas and exploring them more as well. Cause like I say, I like to just because I think that if you just have one conversation with lots of different people, yes. each time you've got to start from the beginning and you don't get to go any deeper and explore more. And I think we've covered a lot of things that are worth revisiting and going away and thinking about and then coming back with points and stuff like that. So um did you want to kind of wrap it up now um, as you're getting tired um but i really appreciate you taking the time i've really enjoyed the conversation you too. Uh, um, okay. and i will definitely um pass on your arguments to people like stefan kinsella um and i will get back to you with any responses <laughs> they've got um like i say you know my my points are as they stand but i do think that is a very good point to make about the whole well, where does it stop with regards to what part of yourself you're selling and where does it become yeah yeah so it's it's a, it's a good point well made um and i really appreciate the conversation so good night and uh i send uh, my greetings to all the people who are listening to this or watching this bye 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 thank you